I'm Dr. Fakir Abadi and this is Human Immunodeficiency Virus in Adults Part 1. Nobody knows the exact origin of HIV virus, but it probably spread from non-human primates to humans in the 1900s. If you don't treat HIV, an infected person typically progresses to death over a period of 10 years. So it's a very deadly disease. And it primarily affects men who have sex with men, which we call MSM, people who inject drugs, people in prisons and closed uh, settings, sex workers, transgender people, and of course infants of HIV positive mothers. Now it is important to keep in mind that HIV is not transmitted by air or water, with saliva, sweat, tears, or closed mouth kissing, insects or pets, or sharing toilet food or drinks. Another important thing to keep in mind is that women have been historically underrepresented in clinical studies. This is an important thing to point out in Journal Club. And in the US, about 25% of HIV infected patients are women. Let's take a look at the prevalence of HIV in the world, in the US and in California. So on the left side, we're looking at the, at the world on the y-axis, we're looking at the number of HIV-infected people in units of millions. So you can see that in the world, about 37 million people are infected with HIV. And of course, about 185 million people have hepatitis C. Compare that to 350 million people with hepatitis B and 415 people with type 2 diabetes. Now, you can see similar patterns in the U.S. and in California. So for example, in, uh, in the U.S., about 1.2 million people have HIV compared to 30 million people who have been estimated to have type 2 diabetes. So, you know, you are a lot more likely to see a patient with type 2 diabetes than you are to see a patient who has HIV or hep C. Unless, of course, if you work specifically at immu immunosuppression uh, clinic where you see specifically HIV and uh, hep C patients. Now, when we look at new HIV diagnoses in the United States, you will see that uh, two-thirds of the cases are in men having sex with men, so MSM, either gay or uh, bisexual, uh, followed by about 23% in heterosexual individuals and about 7% in people who inject drugs. And of course, as a result of this, majority of cases, about 81% are in men. Now, on the left, you will see that majority of cases are in minority, so the top three uh, bars are um, minority MSM followed by minority heterosexual individuals. And I'm not showing you the data for age groups, but recently there has been uh, the highest number of HIV diagnosis in people aged 25 to 34 years of age. Now let's take a look at the HIV virus itself. The HIV virus is a retrovirus and a unique capability of it is that it's able to integrate its DNA into the host genome. Now, generally speaking, there is HIV-1 and HIV-2. In the United States, it's predominantly HIV-1, whereas in, uh, um, you know, most of Africa, you will see HIV-2, which is not common in the United States. Now, HIV-1 itself uh, has different groups. Group M happens to be the major, uh, major group of HIV-1, and group M itself will be broken into several clades. So there's clade A, B, C, uh, etc. And when you compare HIV-1 to HIV-2, HIV-1 is more prevalent and also more pathogenic than HIV-2. Now let's take a look at the structure of the virus. So you can see that the genetic content of the virus actually codes for several proteins. And these proteins, so this at the top is just the genome of the HIV. Uh, so different genes will code for different proteins. And every protein has a crucial function for the virus. So in the structure, you can see that there are some proteins that are structural proteins, like envelope proteins. So they have a very important function when it comes to cell entry. So these proteins need to bind to the host cell. And also there are, uh, there are a few um, enzymatic proteins. So for example, the one of the important ones is the 
RT or reverse uh, reverse transcriptase. Uh, there's also integrase and there's also protease. So reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease are three of the most important enzymes of the HIV, and we actually target them with drugs. So it's important to know because uh, the mechanism of action of some of our antiretrovirals um, is actually based on this. The first learning objective is describe the HIV life cycle and the mechanism of action of antiretroviral agents. HIV virus primarily affects the CD4 uh, T cells. So CD4 T helper cells are a very important part of the immune system in the human body. So let's start here. When the virus finds a CD4 T cell, the first thing it does is that it's going to attach to the CD4 receptor. So some of those uh, envelope proteins, they actually detect the CD4 receptor. And this um, process is called attachment. And we also have drugs, some drugs that will inhibit the attachment called attachment inhibitors. Now, th the binding of these uh, envelope proteins to the CD4 receptor alone is not sufficient for cell entry. So it also, the virus also requires core receptors. And these core receptors are either CCR5 or CXCR4. And this depends on the virus. So some viruses prefer CCR5 and some viruses prefer CXCR4. And this is referred to as tropisome. So once the virus bonds to the CD4 receptor and the core receptor together, then this, uh, the virus will actually be able to fuse and enter the cell. This process is called fusion and we also have some drugs that block this process referred to as fusion inhibitors. Once the virus fuses, the content of the virus will go inside the cell. So inside we have genetic material and we have some of those enzymes that came with the, um, with the virus. So for example, reverse transcriptase is one of the important ones. And if you guys remember from the central dogma of molecular biology, the process of transcription is typically from DNA transcribing into RNA. And the reason this enzyme is called reverse transcriptase is because the material that comes with the HIV is actually in RNA form and reverse transcriptase will convert that RNA into DNA. So it goes from RNA to DNA. So it's in reverse. And uh, what this enzyme reverse transcriptase does is that it will use nucleotide. So natural nucleotide that are in the host cell will be utilized in order to form this DNA. So we can actually target this with two classes of drugs. One class is the nucleotide analog re reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So these are basically drugs that kind of look like natural um, nucleotides. So the reverse transcriptase will accidentally use them and insert them into this DNA. But because they're not natural nucleotides, they won't be able to uh, make links and then uh, it will interrupt the transcription. So we can have um, a nucleotide reverse transcriptase or NUCs for short. Another class is non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. These are not necessarily analogs of nucleotides, but these are molecules that actually have affinity for the reverse transcriptase. So by binding to reverse transcriptase, they will actually inhibit its function. So these are called non nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors or non nucs for short. And then once uh, this DNA is made, then it will go inside the nucleus of the host. And then another enzyme that came with uh, another enzyme that came with the virus is integrase. And what integrase does is that it will actually integrate this new DNA from the HIV and will integrate it into the host DNA. And by doing that, it will actually make the HIV genetic material as part of the host DNA. And that's why, you know, it's, um, um, you know, we don't, we don't currently have a cure for HIV because its material actually gets integrated into the host DNA. Now, once this material is uh, integrated into the host DNA, the virus doesn't have to do anything now. Um, the central uh, machinery of, uh, of the host cell will actually trans, uh, transcribe this DNA material into RNA and then this RNA will go and find a ribosome and translate into proteins. So, you know, these are genes from the host as well as any gene from 
from the HIV. So if it happens to be HIV genes here, the end product is, you know, those proteins that are required for HIV. So for example, reverse transcriptase will be made here, integrase will be made here, protease will be made here, and those envelope proteins, they will all be here, made here, and then they all assemble into a new virus, which will bud and exit the cell. Now, once this new uh, new virus exits the cell, it's not mature at the beginning. So that's where protease will come in. Protease is very important for the virus because it will actually have the function of maturing that cell. So without that protease, that new HIV virus will not be able to infect other cells. So for it to become mature and then be able to infect other cells, it needs the function of protease. And because of that, we actually have a class of drugs called protease inhibitors, specifically HIV protease inhibitors that will block this process. And these protease inhibitors, HIV protease inhibitors are different than hepatitis C protease inhibitor. So do not confuse these two different classes of protease inhibitors. Let's take a look at the pathogenesis of HIV. As you know by now, the primary route of transmission is by sexual contact. So if it's through vaginal sex, you can see that this is the mucos, mucosal layer of the vagina. So the virus can easily penetrate through this layer and enter the body. Or if it's, um, you know, men having sex with men in the rectal tissue, there are dendritic cells that actually have the function of surveying uh, the system. And they would, this dendritic cell will actually pick up the virus to hand it to the immune system to get rid of. So regardless of which route, the virus will end up in the body and will find a CD4 T cell. It can also infect macrophages, but the primary route is through CD4. Because, and, and the reason it's really important to focus on the CD4 because CD4 T cells typically are either activated or in a resting uh, phase. When a CD4 T cell is activated, that means the cell is actually um, you know, uh, converting the genetic material into protein, whereas in the resting CD4 T cell, it's actually silent. So it's not really producing any, um, any proteins from the genetic material. And the HIV can actually infect all of them. So the reason this is important is when HIV is integrated into DNA of a resting CD4 T cell, it's hard to detect it because the virus is actually inside the DNA and because it's not actually uh, being converted into any protein, there are no antigens or there are no, um, no antigens to be detected by the immune system. Whereas in an activated CD4 T cell, because of these end products, the immune system can actually detect it. It can uh, basically kill the CD4 T cells and also cause uh, inflammation. But because of these resting CD4 T cells, uh, whatever HIV is in there, it will actually be archived and stay in the in the in the body of the host without uh, any uh, without the body being able to get rid of. So basically, these resting CD4 cells will act as a reservoir for the HIV material. So even though the immune system continues to fight all the infected cells and it will continue to kill the infected cells, whether they are macrophages or uh, or the um, activated CD4 T cells, those um, you know latent, latently infected CD4 T cells will continue to be there, and occasionally, you know, they become active, um, but they, uh, you know, so the body can never completely get rid of them. So two things happen: as these CD4 T cells get activated, the immune system will kill them. So because of the destruction of these CD4 T cells, the CD4 uh, T cell count will actually start to drop because some of them are dying. Another thing that happens because of the inflammation and all this uh, immune response is that the lymphatic tissue that's responsible for making these CD4 T cells starts to die because of the inflammation and the response of them. So because of this, uh, you, we get decreased production of the CD4 cells. So there are two reasons for why HIV infected patients start to have low CD4 uh, CD4 counts. That's because of increased destruction of the activated ones and also decreased production. So this is a progressive disease. As uh, patients get infected, there's initially there's acute uh, HIV infection, 
which initially the immune system uh, starts to kill all of those activated CD4 cells and infected macrophages. And then there's a period of clinical latency where, you know, um, there's not a whole lot of symptoms and uh, a lot of these uh, CD4 T cells are resting. And then uh, over time, because of the CD4 cells uh, count starts to drop, then the immune system will be weakened and eventually will be non-existent and that's when the patient will have AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So not everyone infected with HIV has AIDS. It's only advanced HIV that we call AIDS and by definition it's you know if if the CD4 T cell count is less than 200 or if the CD4 T cell count is not available then you can look at the percentage of the CD4. So if the so if less than 14% of lymphocytes are CD4, um, this would be referred to as AIDS. Or if even if someone has higher uh, than 200 or higher than 14% CD4, but happens to get the AIDS-defining uh, condition, then this will be uh, classified as AIDS. And those AIDS-defining uh, conditions are actually listed here for, for your reference. You can see that initially a normal person has over a thousand uh, cells of uh, CD4 T cells. As you can see, initially during that acute phase where there's a high uh, level of RNA, uh, HIV RNA, the CD4 cells starts to drop very quickly. And then the immune system will take over and then it will be, uh, you know, the CD4 starts to go back up. And then at some point you, you reach the set point where lymphatic tissue starts to die and then the body cannot keep up with production of CD4. And as those resting CD4 cells become active, the immune system starts to kill them. So you can see that over a few years, the CD4 count starts to drop and drop and drop. And then once it goes less than 200, that's when really, uh, you know, we, we say that the patient has AIDS and st they start to get these opportunistic infections that will kill the patient. And not just uh, infections, but also because the immune system has the function of surveying for cancer forming cells and uh, destroying them. As these CD, uh, CD4 cells can start, these patients are also at risk of getting uh, various types of uh, cancer. Now, when it comes to the symptoms during the acute phase where the, you know, where there's a surge of uh, viral load, uh, that's when uh, patients start to have flu-like symptoms. So it, typically two to six weeks after primary infections. So, you know, they're very similar to the common cold or, or the flu. And then, uh, be, uh, you know, beyond that, the patients become asymptomatic until the, uh, the infection actually advances. So the chronic phase is basically asymptomatic until the patient gets uh, opportunistic infections. And then in uh, you know, very advanced uh, phases of the infection, you also see cardiovascular disease, cancer, and eventually death. Let's take a look at four classes of drugs that affect HIV cell entry. We have CD4 receptor antibody Ibalizumab, Ibalizumab is a recombinant humanized monoclonal antibody and it actually binds to the CD4 receptor on the T cell. So in this picture, you can see the CD4 receptor here and thereby prevents conformational changes in the CD4 HIV envelope glycoprotein uh, 120 that are essential for viral entry. So that's how it blocks entry of HIV-1 into CD4 cell and prevents uh, its transmission via cell-cell fusion. Now it's important to note that because this antibody binds to uh, uh, CD4 uh, receptor, it actually does not interfere with the normal CD4 cell activity. So those CD4 uh, T cells will still be functional. Next we have CCR5 inhibitor Maraviroc which basically binds to CCR5, which is one of the core receptors required uh, for cell entry. And it changes its conformation and prevents uh, GP120 CCR5 binding. Next, we have Enfuvertide, which is a fusion inhibitor. It actually mimics the GP41 protein uh, on the virus. And by doing so, it prevents uh, fusion with the CD4 uh, cell membrane. And more recently, we have a new drug on the market, Fostemsavir, uh, which is an attachment inhibitor. 
This one binds to GP120 and basically prevents HIV virus attachment to, uh, to CD4 T cell. Now, you already know the mechanism of action of nukes and non-nukes, which basically interfere reverse transcriptase inside the cell. And lastly, you also know the mechanism of action of integrase inhibitor, which prevent integration of HIV genome into the host, uh, host genome. And lastly, uh, we have protease inhibitors because once uh, the cell cycle continues, these proteases are needed for maturation of the final HIV virion, and protease inhibitors actually uh, block the maturation of uh, the new HIV virions. So far, we described the HIV life cycle and the mechanism of action of antiretroviral agents. Now, given a treatment-naive HIV-1 patient, recommend DHHS guideline concordant antiretroviral therapy. Let's take a look at some reliable resources. For HIV infection and anything that's associated with HIV, such as opportunistic infections, we use uh, in the United States the DHHS guidelines. So the DHHS stands for the Department of Health and Human Services, and their guidelines actually uh, updated at least a couple of times a year uh, and they are available online so they have several guidelines they have one for HIV 1 in uh, for use of antiretroviral agents in HIV 1 infected adults and adolescents uh, they have one for uh, for pregnancy uh, they also have a couple on pediatrics the focus of this uh, presentation is on adult um, in HIV they also have a Guideline for pre-exposure prophylaxis and a couple on post-exposure prophylaxis along with uh, CDC guidelines for diagnosis of HIV. Let's take a look at diagnosis of HIV. These are the recommendations from the 2014 CDC guidelines. Since 2014, it's been recommended to use an assay that's a combination of antigen antibody. And these are antigen and antibodies from both HIV-1 and HIV-2. And if this does not test positive, so if it's non-reactive, now assuming that the patient has not had a risky behavior in the previous 15 to 20 days, then we can confidently conclude that the patient does not have HIV. And this test has a very high sensitivity and specificity. It does take some time for the body to make um, antibodies and for the antigen levels to increase in the plasma levels. Therefore, it, uh, you know, if, it's, uh, if someone has just been exposed to HIV, this test is unlikely to detect it. Now, if someone does test positive, we don't know if it's HIV-1 or HIV-2. So therefore, we need to do another assay, which is an antibody differentiation to figure out if this is HIV-1, HIV-2 or both. If antibodies for HIV-1 are detected but not HIV-2, we can conclude that the patient has HIV-1. If the uh, antibodies for HIV-1 are negative but HIV-2 is positive, we can conclude that the patient has HIV-2. If both of them are positive, then the patient actually is co-infected with HIV-1 and 2. And if neither of them test positive, now we have a problem because initially the antigen antibody tested positive, but now we didn't find HIV-1 or 2. Now, to resolve this issue, we actually need to do nucleic acid test. A nucleic acid test is a lot more accurate because instead of antigen or antibody, it actually detects the HIV RNA. So if this test positive, then we can uh, conclude that the patient has HIV. And currently in the US, HIV-2 is not common. So the uh, nucleic acid tests that are FDA approved are only for HIV-1. Now, if this patient does not test positive, we can conclude that the patient does not have HIV-1. And this is assuming that the patient did not have risky behavior in the past week. So it typically takes about six, um, six days for the RNA levels to go high enough for this test to actually detect it. This nucleic acid test is a qualitative test, so it basically tells you if the RNA is there or not. Regardless, when someone is uh, tested positive, we actually need to do PCR in order to quantify the viral load. 
Uh, the primary reason that this algorithm exists is because these antigen antibody assays are actually more affordable than the nucleic acid test. So if you're using it for screening purposes uh, where majority of patients will actually be non-reactive, this is a more cost-effective way of screening people. And then people who test positive will actually end up with uh, more tests and possibly nucleic acid tests which are more expensive. Okay, let's take a look at HIV serology. So in this figure on the x-axis, we're looking at time uh, in uh, units of days after uh, exposure to HIV. And you can see that the first few days, it's referred to as eclipse period. And it basically means that it takes a while for the HIV to replicate and actually become detectable. So, uh, you know, what we basically use to detect HIV uh, the soonest is the nucleic acid amplification test, uh, which basically can be detected by day six to eight, uh, you know, whereas uh, within the first five days, it's going to be undetectable. And then between days 13 and 20 is when the P24 antigen can be detected and depending on what uh, uh, source you look at you will see different numbers so some sources say 15 to 20 days some say 13 to 20 it's clear that around you know two to three weeks after exposure is when uh, this antigen will be detected and then it will take uh, significantly longer for the body to make antibodies and then those antibody tests to be detected. Now, up to 38% of new HIV infections are transmitted by people who are unaware of their HIV status. So it is important to screen uh, people who are at risk for HIV. In fact, the 2019 USPSTF uh, recommendations for HIV screening includes all adolescents and adults aged 15 to 65 years. And then people who are younger or older, if they have uh, increased risk of infection, should also be screened. And of course, all pregnant uh, persons, including those who are uh, present in labor or at delivery, um, whose HIV status is unknown, should be screened for HIV. So when should uh, treatment be started in patients uh, with HIV? Now, in the old days, it used to be that the recommendation was based on the CD4 count. So patients who had lower CD4 count, they were at higher risk of having opportunistic infections, uh, cancer, and uh, of course mortality. So, um, and of course older HIV drugs were very toxic. So uh, we would actually reserve it for uh, more severe patients. But nowadays HIV drugs are very effective. They're very well tolerated. And we have clinical evidence that regardless of CD4 count, when we start treatment for HIV, we can actually reduce the rate of morbidity and the rate of mortality associated with HIV infection. And this mortality could be due to cardiovascular disease, it could be due to cancer, it could be due to opportunistic infection, um, so it actually can be significantly high. And HIV uh, treatment can actually reduce these numbers significantly. And of course, uh, the other issue is transmission. And uh, we do have very good evidence that once we start treatment, uh, HIV transmission will be re uh, significantly reduced. And this transmission could be to sexual partners, as well as vertical transmission from infected mothers to, uh, to the infant. Now, the December 2019 update of the DHS, DHHS guidelines uh, recommend initiating ART immediately. So immediately means basically the same day that the patient is diagnosed with HIV or as soon as possible after HIV diagnosis. And this is because it has been shown to increase uptake of ART and linkage to care, as well as achieving viral suppression faster in individuals and improve the rate of virologic suppression in patients with HIV. Now, when it comes to ART, it is very important to educate patients about the benefits and considerations of ART and to address strategies to optimize adherence. So we will talk about adherence shortly, but adherence is very important. So if there is concern about patients achieving at, uh, being adherent uh, to ART, then instead of starting ART immediately, it may be more reasonable to delay it a little bit, uh, but do it as soon as possible. So as soon as the patient has access to care and the patient is uh, ready to adhere to ART. Interrupting ART can lead to rebound viremia, worsening of immune function and increased morbidity and mortality. So therefore, once ART is initiated, it has to be continued 
with the following goals. So the goal is to maximally and durably suppress uh, HIV RNA in the plasma, uh, to restore and preserve the immune function in HIV patients, to reduce HIV associated morbidity and prolong the duration and quality of survival, and prevent HIV transmission. Now it is uh, a comment that once ART is initiated, because these uh, regimens are very effective, that the patient can actually achieve a viral load reduction within the first 12 to 24 weeks of therapy. So within 12 to 24 weeks of initiating ART, the viral load should be undetectable. And recent data has shown that in patients who have a viral load of less than 200, so in, in general, less than 50 is considered undetectable. So even anything less than 200, uh, studies have shown that the rate of transmission is basically non-existent. So now we say uh, the slogan U equals U, so undetectable equals untransmittable. And this has um, serious consequences when it comes to the uh, stigma that's associated with HIV. So we're starting a new culture of U equals U because as long as a patient is taking their ART and the viral load is undetectable, then they cannot transmit it to their partner. Now, generally there are th three different strategies for ART regimens. The historic uh, strategy would be the triple therapy, which basically would include two NRTIs or two nukes as the backbone plus a third agent. And the third agent can be either an integrase uh, inhibitor or a protease inhibitor or a non nuke So two nukes plus a non nuke Now, in general, majority of integrase inhibitors are uh, recommended first line. So that's why this one is green. And we'll talk more about specific agents uh, shortly. We also have dual therapy. So dual therapy could be in two different ways. One is that you actually drop one of the NRTIs. And the reason we do combination therapy is that, you know, HIV has a high uh, propensity for developing resistance. So by using combination, we can uh, basically uh, prevent uh, resistant development. So the, with the dual therapy, you basically drop one of the nukes so you have one nuke plus an integrase inhibitor uh, you are which is you know first line you also have one nuke plus protease inhibitor which is uh, alternative and we'll talk about specific regimens shortly you also have nrti free or nuke free dual therapy so this is basically no nuke included in the regimen so this is basically a combination of integrase inhibitor plus a non-nuke and the reason this is red is because it is not recommended as initial treatment it's recommended for people who already have received treatment from another uh, ART and achieved undetectable viral load then they can switch to this strategy another non-nuke uh, dual therapy includes integrase inhibitor plus a protease inhibitor now, generally speaking, majority of first-line regimens that are recommended uh, follow this rule that you need a backbone plus a third agent. So we use two nukes or two nucleotide reverse transcriptors in, uh, inhibitors as a backbone plus a third agent. So we, it's important to have this combination in order to prevent HIV from um, developing resistance. And generally speaking, we have three backbones that are commonly used. So we have Epsicom, which is a combination of Lamevudine and Abacavir. We have Truvada, which is Emtricitabine and Tenofovir uh, disoproxol fumarate. And we have Descovi, which is a combination of Emtricitabine and Tenofovir alafenamide. And I'll explain what's the difference between Tenofovir disoproxol fumarate and Tenofovir alafenamide. Uh, shortly. Now, lamevudine and abacavir are two nukes that are commonly used in combination in Epsicom. So this would be one pill that would be used as a backbone. So if you are to use Epsicom as the backbone, you still need a third agent uh, to go with it. Um, between lamevudine and abacavir, lamevudine also has activity against hepatitis B. Abacavir does not, so it's important to make sure that you are aware whether the patient also is co-infected with uh, hepatitis B. 
because for example if uh, we are using something that covers hepatitis b and then later you uh, decide to switch it to something that does not cover hepatitis b the patient can have um, you know reactivation of, of hep b and possibly hep b uh, flares uh, which could uh, potentially be fatal now all of these drugs in this class of uh, nrti's or nukes uh, because they actually are analogs of nucleic acids um, that means that any um, any RNA or DNA transcriptase can uh, or polymerase can actually use this so especially with the older uh, NRTIs that we no longer use they had the affinity for human mitochondrial DNA um, and uh, because of that they were associated with lactic acidosis and this became a black box warning which uh, you know for the entire class so these new drugs that we use or I should say relatively newer um, you know compared to the drugs from the 80s um, these have lower affinity for mitochondrial DNA and therefore they are not likely to cause lactic acidosis uh, but regardless the FDA has this black box warning for all uh, NRTIs. Uh, one thing that's specific uh, with Abacavir, before anybody can be started on Abacavir, uh, we should actually do a, a genomic uh, polymer, uh, polymorphism test of HLA-B5701 and you should only start Abacavir if someone tests negative for HLA-B5701 and that's because uh, you know people who test positive for HLA-B5701 are at least 50 per they have a at least 50 percent increased risk of having fatal hypersensitivity reaction to uh, to this drug so th this is it's crucial to test this before starting Abacavir so that becomes one of the limitations of using Abacavir because you cannot so, so if somebody tests HIV positive and you want to use this you have to order this test and it typically takes a few days um, around a week to come back uh, so it kind of delays therapy uh, but you know some uh, some patients may have no other option so we have no choice but to test this and then once they test negative uh, we can start uh, a regimen that includes abacavir now all nrti's are renally cleared except abacavir so abacavir is actually um, cleared hepatically so uh, you may need to dose adjust it in patients with uh, mild hepatic dysfunction whereas all other NRTIs actually need to be renally adjusted so for example lamivudine uh, creatine crans cutoff is uh, 50. Now as a class all NRTIs can cause nausea vomiting uh, headache uh, rash and increased um, uh, liver enzymes uh, Lamevudine specifically uh, is very well tolerated in general, uh, but it does, um, you know, cause in uh, some patients uh, fatigue and insomnia. Abacavir, of course, can cause hypersensitivity reaction, uh, uh, especially if patients have HLA-B5701. So HLA-B5701 positivity is a contraindication, uh, and of course, it can also cause fatigue. Now, when it comes to the other combinations for the backbone, we have either Truvada or Descovy. So Truvada was their first, which is a combination of emtricitabine and tenofovir disoproxol fumarate. And these two combinations, both of them cover hepatitis B. Uh, and of course, they still have this lactic acidosis black box warning, which all NRTIs do. And both of them are renally cleared, so creatine crayons cut off of 50 for these two. Uh, TAF or tenofovir alafenamide is a newer formulation of tenofovir, uh, which is um, actually uh, creatine crayons cut off is uh, lower, so you can actually still use it in uh, some patients with uh, CKD. Uh, generally speaking, uh, these drugs are very well tolerated. m specifically can cause hyperpigmentation. Uh, TDF can cause nephrotoxicity and uh, bone mineral loss and this in fact is the reason that uh, we actually came up with a new formulation of tenofovir, tenofovir alafenamide which, which still does have tox uh, nephrotoxicity and bone mineral loss but it's significantly less compared to TDF 
and I'll explain that more. Now, note that this binner, uh, you know, these uh, uh, tenofovir does not cause uh, bone toxicity in the sense that it does not cause bone uh, marrow suppression. It just uh, causes some bone mineral loss. So this is not the same as uh, bone mineral uh, suppression. This just increases the risk of osteoporosis. Now let's take a look at the difference between TDF and TAF. So tenofovir itself is the actual drug. Tenofovir is the actual drug that's an analog of a nucleotide. And uh, that's what needs to go inside the target cell to block HIV replication. The problem is when you orally take tenofovir, it's actually not absorbed. So this is this part is the GI tract. And you, when you take a pill of tenofovir, you would like it to be absorbed and go into the blood. And then the blood, uh, you know, in the circulation, uh, HIV actually is inside the CD4 cell. So the target cell is the CD4 cell. That's where HIV replicates. You want this uh, tenofovir to be absorbed into the blood and then from the blood to go to the CD4 cell and then find the HIV virus and block its replication. The problem is tenofovir is not absorbed. So we had to do something. We had to uh, come up with some sort of uh, salt formulations that increases absorption. And that's why we had TDF. So tenofovir disoproxol fumarate actually gets absorbed from the GI tract. So if you were to give 300 milligram, it gets absorbed. And then a tiny portion of what gets absorbed goes to the target cell, CD4. Okay, and that's how much we need in the CD4 in order to prevent rep, uh, replication of HIV. Now the problem is the, ma the majority of this tenofovir is staying in the plasma where we don't need it and guess where it goes? It goes to the kidneys. It's gonna go to the kidneys and it's gonna cause nephrotoxicity. It's also gonna go to the bones and cause bone mineral loss. Things that we do not like. So this has uh, become a problem because patients need to be on these drugs for life and over time this can build up and um, you know uh, patients will have uh, start to have CKD or if they already have CKD the CKD will progress and as we all know as we age we also are all uh, susceptible to bone mineral loss, uh, loss due to just aging and this will actually accelerate it so you know people who have HIV and are aging and are on uh, TDF, uh, they actually will lose more bone, bone uh, mineral. So we came up with TAF, uh, which is a different salt form. So it actually absorbs. So when you take this orally in the GI tract, it gets absorbed. Now, majority of this goes into the target cell. So you get the same amount in the CD4 where you actually need it. And then a tiny portion of it stays in the blood where it's going to go to the kidneys and it's going to go to the bones and it's going to cause uh, some toxicity. But because this is a significantly lower concentration in the blood than compared to TDF, it has significantly less nephrotoxicity and bone mineral loss. And therefore, uh, you know, we're starting to use more and more TAF compared to TDF because the efficacy is the same because you get the exact same amount in the uh, CD4 cell and that's exactly why you, uh, you see a huge difference in the dose. So TDF you need 300 milligram and TAF you need 25 milligram uh, in most regimens unless you have like a uh, inhibitor where you would use a 10 milligram. So if you have uh, cobicistat in the regimen for example you will see 10 milligram. So which regimen should be initiated for HIV uh, patients? So these are recommendations from DHHS guidelines that were updated in 2021. So basically here we have all the regimens that include integrase inhibitors. Uh, you can see that uh, anytime there is a, a slash, that means that multiple drugs are in the same tablet or they're co-formulated, so to speak. Uh, whereas when you see a plus sign, that means there are two different uh, formulations. So you know, basically with this one, you will have to take two tablets. Now, having said that, let's take a look at recommendations. So green basically means recommended first line. So basically um, a triple therapy would be Tegravir as the third agent with the backbone of emtricitabine and uh, tenofovir alafenamide. That's recommended first line. You can also have uh, Dalutegravir 
as the third agent plus um, you know Bakavir and La Mevudin as the ba du dual uh, nuke uh, backbone. Now with Abakavir, it is important to note that there is a HLA B5701 test that must be uh, performed and it has to be negative before the patients can receive a Bakavir because of the risk of hypersensitivity, which can be fatal. Now with this regimen, only Lamevudin is active against hepatitis B. So if someone is co-infected with HIV and hepatitis B, this regimen is not recommended because Abakavir does not have activity against Hep B. Next, we have uh, you know Dalutagravir with a different backbone, so Emtricitabine and Tenofovir. Uh, basically, you can have Descovi or Truvada as the backbone. Uh, and lastly, uh, more recently, we have the backbone of Lamevudin plus Tenofovir as a cheaper option. So these two formulations. Uh, uh, Simduo and uh, Temexis. These are recently, uh, these these are recently available on the market as a cheaper option. So everything so far was a triple therapy. Then we have a dual therapy with a single nuke. So basically, this is the same as Triumeg. They basically drive dropped a bakavir. So it's just dalutegravir plus lamevudin. So you basically don't have to wait for HLA-B5701 because that becomes a barrier if you are to start ART uh, when someone is newly diagnosed uh, with HIV because you have to wait for HLA-B5701 test results to come back. So this takes care of that. Uh, so this is Dovato. And it's important to note that this uh, Dovato can only be used if the RNA viral load is less than uh, 500,000 copies per ml. And again, because you only have a single agent that's active against hepatitis B, it should not be used in patients who are co-infected with hepatitis B. Now, we used to have two more integrase inhibitors that used to be first line, but now they are considered alternative because we have so many other regimens that are actually, uh, you know, uh, easier for patients to take. So, raltegravir, um, you know, because you have to take it twice a day and it's two pills, it's not available as a single uh tablet regimen so for that reason it's uh, considered alternative uh, and then we have Elvitegravir uh, boosted with Cobicistat so Cobicistat is a pharmacokinetic booster with the backbone of Emtricitabine and Tenofovir so although there are four drugs here really there are three this is a triple therapy you have two nukes and an integrase inhibitor Cobicistat has no activity against HIV it's just a pharmacokinetic booster now this is alternative is no longer first line. It used to be first line. And the reason is because of this um, pharmacokinetic booster, uh, there are a lot of drug interactions and this is a very large pill. Uh, so for that reason, it's no longer recommended first line because we have so many other options that work uh, perfectly. And then we have a couple of non-nuke dual therapies. So one is dalutegravir plus a non-nuke which is Rolpevirin, and then Cabotegravir, which was recently approved, uh, plus uh, Rolpevirin. And the reason these are red, because they are not recommended as initial therapy, because in order to use this, basically patients have to already receive another ART and achieve undetectable viral load, and only then uh, they can switch to this regimen. So first, patients have to have undetectable viral load. So with uh, Juluca, it has to be at least for six months, and the patient cannot have history of treatment failure or resistance. With cabotegravir, uh, you know, and, and this is actually real covering, uh, these are injectable uh, combinations. So basically, uh, this is to improve adherence because these are once a month injections. So basically, First, the patient has to take an, a different ART and achieve undetectable viral load. And then for about a month, the patient will receive oral formulation of these two drugs just to make sure they can tolerate it. And then the patients will receive intramuscular injections of these two drugs on a monthly basis. And that has to be done in uh, the doctor's office. Now here are some other alternative regimens. So basically anything that includes protease inhibitors, they need to be boosted. Uh, and because protease inhibitors are boosted, 
uh, you know, they they have a lot of drug interactions. And because we have so many other options available, these are considered uh, alternative. Uh, let's see. And then uh, in the second section, we have non-nukes plus two nukes. So efavirenz basically is the non-nuke. And then you have two nukes as the backbone, emtricidivine and tenofovir. Efavirenz is no longer recommended first line. For the longest time, it used to be the drug of choice. And the reason is because of the high risk of uh, suicide uh, ideation and suicide attempt that has been uh, shown with efavirenz. So for that reason, it's no longer first line because we have so many other options that are safer for patients. And then we have combination of relpivirine is the non-nuke. And then we have two nukes as the backbone, emtricidivine and tenofovir. And this option is no longer first line because, uh, you know, in order for relpivirine to be effective, um, you know, the viral load needs to be at baseline less than 100,000 copies and the CD4 cell has to be greater than 200. So the studies have shown that when the viral load was greater than 100,000 or if the CD4 count was less than 200, those are more severe patients and the outcomes were uh, basically poor with this combination. In addition, you know, relpivirin needs an acidic environment for absorption, so that also uh, complicates things. So we have so many other options uh, that are, uh, you know, much better uh, when it comes to adherence for the patients and efficacy and safety. So for that reason, it's no longer uh, treatment uh, of choice. It's considered alternative. And more recently, we have a new non-nuke, doravirin, that's uh, come to the market in the past couple of years. Uh, you know, it's available as a single tablet uh, regimen with lamivudin and tenofovir. It's also available, uh, you know, as a single agent, so you can combine it with any uh, backbone that you want. And this one essentially is right now is uh, considered alternative because of the limited uh, data. Overall, it has a much better safety profile. Uh, and it has a high barrier to resistance. So, you know, if you have uh, patients with HIV resistant to relpivirin or efavirenz, uh, potentially doravirin could maintain activity. And then regimens to consider when, you know, people cannot take uh, nukes, uh, you know, especially a bakavir because of HLA B5701 uh, positive tests, or people who cannot take TDF or TAF because of uh, you know, whether they have kidney disease, advanced kidney disease, or, uh, you know, if they have osteoporosis, um, you know, you can, these are regimens that do not include abacavir ten, or, or tenofovir. So obviously Dovato, uh, which basically has uh, dalutegravir and lamevudine is recommended first line, uh, you know, whether people, uh, you know, whether the reason is for people who cannot tolerate this, or if even if people can't tolerate it, you know, this might be a good idea to give people Dovato to avoid some of the toxicities from these agents. You know, there is a risk of um, cardiovascular disease with Abakevir and, of course, nephrotoxicity and uh, bone mineral density loss with uh, tenofovir. Uh, so Dovato is an option. And then you have a couple other options in case somebody cannot take Dovato, which Dovato is actually, you know, has been on the market in the past couple of years, so it's uh, fairly new. Uh, we have older agents that basically combination of protease inhibitor uh, boosted, uh, of course, uh, with uh, either an integrase in inhibitor raltegravir or with a single nuke uh, lamivudine. And these are, uh, you know, considered alternative because of the drug interactions that you will have to deal with with uh, uh, ritonavir and also raltegravir twice a day could potentially reduce adherence. We looked at the HIV life cycle and the mechanism of action of antiretroviral agents. We looked at the DHH guideline recommendations for treatment naive HIV patients. Now, given a newly diagnosed HIV patient, ensure adherence to ART is optimized. Let's take a look at some causes of treatment failure. It all starts with insufficient drug level. When there is insufficient drug level, HIV starts to replicate in the presence of drug, and that can lead to selective pressure. 
And selective pressure will basically select for strains of HIV that are resistant uh, to the drugs, to, to the antiretroviral drugs. Of course, there's always the possibility that these resistant viruses could have actually been transmitted to the patient from someone else. So if someone else has resistant virus and, you know, whether sexually or, you know, by other uh, means of transmission, uh, that resistant virus can also be uh, uh, in, in the patient. And resistant virus, of course, will lead to treatment failure. There's not much we can do to prevent the transmission of resistant virus from someone else. But we can do a lot of things to prevent insufficient uh, drug level that will lead to resistant virus. As pharmacists, we should always uh, check for drug interactions. So drug interactions, uh, depending on the interaction, of course, can result to uh, insufficient uh, drug levels. Uh, some drugs uh, may be rapidly cleared, so it's important to make sure that the dose is adjusted when necessary. Uh, poor absorption, so depending on the drug, uh, whether it needs to be taken with food, um, the absorption of the drug could be affected, so that's important to keep in mind. And of course, there are some things that are, you know, out of your control, like uh, host uh, genetics. And sometimes the wrong dose may be given to the patient. So as pharmacists, we can ensure that the right dose is given. And historically, suboptimal uh, potency of drugs was leading to uh, some of this resistant virus. Nowadays, the drugs are very potent, so we don't really have that issue anymore. And of course, the biggest thing that results in insufficient drug level that we can intervene with are poor adhere is poor adherence. So poor adherence could be due to different causes. So one is social or personal issues. You know, there is a lot of stigma with HIV. So, uh, you know, if someone is hiding the fact that they have HIV, this could actually prevent them from filling their prescription or actually taking uh, their drugs um, in front of other people, such as friends and family. There could also be issues with a regimen. So, for example, if... Um, if uh, there is a pill burden, if the patient has to take multiple pills throughout the day, or if there are strict requirements for administering the drug. So for example, if somebody has to take it on empty stomach and they're eating all the time, that could be an issue. Or vice versa, if something, uh, you know, if a regimen needs to be taken with food, uh, but someone is doing intermittent uh, fasting, for example, uh, that can cause a problem. And of course, uh, toxicity. So sometimes, um, although most regimens nowadays are well tolerated, uh, occasionally if somebody um, has some toxicities uh, or some adverse effects of the drug, that they could actually stop taking it. For example, if somebody starts to have a rash or, you know, um, na nausea, uh, that could be uh, um, a reason for people to stop uh, taking their drugs. And adherence is extremely important. Um, now, this study was from the, uh, was published in 2000, so these numbers may actually be different uh, today because our drugs are more potent. Uh, but what they looked at is that they looked at different percentage of adherence and looked at the percentage of patients that actually had virologic uh, failure on the vertical axis. So you can see that if when adherence was less than 70%, the HIV regimen basically became worthless because the failure became as high as 82% uh, or even more. And you can see that uh, around 90 to 94% adherence uh, was really required to have a high um, or less uh, failure rate and really 95%. And of course, you know, those agents that were used here uh, were less potent compared to what we have today. But regardless, it's recommended that adherence of 90 to 100% is necessary to achieve and maintain viral suppression. So it's very important to talk to patients to make sure that they're actually uh, ready to um, adhere to these drugs because this is a lifetime commitment. So we need to make sure they're ready for adherence before we actually initiate them because once you initiate them, you do not want them uh, to interrupt uh, the regimen because that will lead to selective pressure uh, which can lead to resistant viruses. So this 90 to 100 uh, percent adherence is very uh, crucial. Uh, and if you think about it, if somebody misses one pill a week, that's about 85 to 86 percent adherence. So even missing one pill a week is not enough. So they need to, uh, you know, they should not miss more than two pills a month. So two pills 
out of 28 days will result about um, 93% 90, adherence. Now, how do you measure adherence? There's no gold standard for measuring adherence, but there are things that we can do. So if you actually get the viral load in the patient and it's uh, suppressed or it's undetected, that's a very good uh, indicator that the patient is actually taking it, so it's working. Studies have shown that patients self-report usually overestimates. However, if the patient actually reports that they're not adherent, that's a very good indicator of suboptimal therapeutic response. And one thing that we can do as, pharm as pharmacists is to actually check pharmacy records. Uh, for example, if somebody had a, um, had a 30 day supply and they haven't filled it for three months, that's a good indicator that they haven't been taking their um, their medications. And you can actually occasionally uh, do a pill count to make sure that they're actually taking it. Now, some factors that are associated with reduced adherence is, um, you know, one is pill burden. So in general, if you can give the patients a single pill, that would improve adherence as opposed to multiple pills. One issue is uh, low literacy. So if the patient cannot read the instructions, um, that are on the label that could uh, lead to adherence. So for example, if you have a regimen that the patient needs to take twice a day, but they're taking it once a day, um, you know, that's gonna result in suboptimal um, exposure to the drug. So it's important to make sure that the patient understands how to take their medications. Younger age is associated with adherence failure, uh, and usually because um, Younger people are just not used to taking medication, so they may not uh, know how to, or they may not remember uh, to take it. Whereas older people who already take drugs for hypertension, for example, they're more used to it, so they have uh, the habit of, uh, you know, going to their medica uh, taking their medications daily. Some other challenges, especially in older uh, patients, are uh, polypharmacy. So if somebody has to go through ten bottles, you know, that's uh, cumbersome. Uh, some some elderly have vision loss, so they may not be able to read the label even if they have the literacy uh, or they may not see where their uh, medication is. And of course, as we all age, we'll have cognitive impairment, so they may be confused. They may not remember if they took it or not. Uh, they, might, they might think that they already took it, but they didn't. So that can lead to um, adherence issues. Uh, other things include... Um, uh, stigma, so some people may not want to uh, have their friends know that they're taking this medication, so they may want to hide it, they may not have the opportunity to take it. Uh, other psychosocial uh, stresses, um, uh, especially active drug use or alcoholism can uh, reduce adherence. So, you know, if somebody's under the influence, uh, you know, they may not necessarily be, oh my God, it's time for me to take my pills. You know, they may be uh, doing other things and not be aware of it. Uh, mental illness, uh, of course, uh, can lead to uh, reduced adherence and, of course, uh, medication adverse effects. So if somebody's uh, experiencing these, they're less likely to want to continue to take it, especially if this is a lifetime um, commitment, uh, which can uh, result in treatment fatigue because, you know, they have to keep taking this pill every day, every day for the rest of their life. And occasionally cost and access to the medication can be an issue. And of course, the opposite of those factors will improve uh, adherence. So for example, if you simplify the regimen once daily dosing, uh, that can improve um, uh, adherence. And when it comes to adherence, um, we as pharmacists have a key role. There are many things we can do to improve adherence at the pharmacy. Perhaps the most important intervention we can make is education, with the, whether we provide education to, the, to other clinicians or education to the patient regarding the actual HIV infection, how to treat it, how to prevent it, how to prevent transmission, um, how to um, stay adherent to the regimen, how to follow up with their uh, clinician and individualize uh, the regimen to the patients. And there are tools that we have at our, expo uh, at our disposal, uh, such as pill boxes. Pill boxes are useful when someone has multiple pills to take, so they can, so ex especially if the uh, schedule is different. So if, if one pill is twice a day, another pill is once a day, uh, you can easily set those up in a pill box, uh, whereas pill box might not be as useful if just a single drug once a day. You know, if in fact pill boxes are, uh, are large, 
uh, and they take space as uh, as compared to a single bottle. But if somebody has you know multiple bottles of pills, a pill box will be uh, very valuable. Uh, there are dosing packets that we can use to make it uh, easier for patients. And of course, uh, because um, oftentimes patients forget to take their drug, there are tools we can use to remind them. So there are telephone services that they can subscribe to. Uh, they, uh, you know, they can receive messages and of course with the uh, current technology there are um, smart devices that you can use apps on so including uh, um, smartphones and other devices uh, you can also if someone doesn't have a smart device they can actually set the alarm on their watch so when the alarm goes off uh, you know similar to some of the techniques that we tell patients to remember their birth control basically um, and of course there are other tools that we can do to improve adherence now the question is, so if someone has adherence issues, uh, you know, we still need to treat them. So how are we going to approach it? So because adherence, as I explained, is going to lead to suboptimal exposure to the drug and then selective pressure will lead to drug resistance. One thing we can do in patients who have adherence concerns is to actually use drugs that have a high genetic barrier to resistance. So we can use either dalutegravir or darunavir. So these, uh, darunavir is a protease inhibitor and dalutegravir is a second generation pro, uh, uh, integrase inhibitor. And these, because they have a high genetic barrier, are recommended uh, in these patients because if they miss a dose or two, these uh, drugs are less likely to lead to resistance compared to uh, other regimens. Now it's not to say that these are 100% proof it's just that these are less likely to select for resistance. And Bictegravir is not in the guideline for this purpose. Uh, Bictegravir is also a second generation um, integrase inhibitor with a high genetic barrier. So as more uh, information becomes available about Bictegravir, that will uh, potentially be an option as well. But as of right now, it's not in the guideline for this purpose specifically. We described the HIV life cycle and the mechanism of action of antiretroviral agents. We looked at DHHS guideline recommendations for treatment naive HIV-1 patients. We ensured adherence to Optima's ART in newly diagnosed HIV patients. Now, given an HIV patient, design an individualized monitoring plan. First, let's take a look at a few definitions. Viral separation by definition is a HIV RNA level that is below the lower limit of detection of available assays. In clinical trials, usually this is considered a viral load less than 50 copies per ml. Virologic failure is any time a viral load is actually more than 200 copies per ml. Incomplete virologic response if, is if the viral load is greater than 200 in two consecutive uh, viral loads that are separated by 24 weeks. So if you get a single level that's greater than 200, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a complete uh, virologic response. You have to look at the trend. So it could be that the viral load is greater than 200, but it's trending down. So it's important to get a second one and uh, to, to, to see if it's trending down or up. Virologic rebound is uh, when a patient has virologic suppression, but then after virologic suppression, then the viral load becomes greater than 200 copies per ml. And a virologic blip is um, once the patient gets uh, virologic suppression, then there's a single isolated detectable RNA level, and then the patient goes back to suppression. So this is uh, a quick uh, virologic blip. And of course, Low-level viremia is uh, if uh, the virus the virus is actually detected, so greater than 50, uh, but actually less than 200. Let's take a look at what happens uh, when we actually initiate ART. In an uninfected person who does not have HIV, a normal CD4 count is usually around 800 to 1200 cells per uh, microliter or more. In HIV-infected patients, the CD4 count starts to drop. So for most patients, it's about uh, 200 to 500. And of course, once CD4 count drops to less than 200, at that point, the patient has AIDS. Alternatively, if the percentage of lymphocytes, that CD4 is 14% or less, uh, that also constitutes AIDS. Now, once we initiate ART in the first month, so within 30 days, you should suspect a two-log drop in uh, viral load. 
so for example if um and of course every log is you basically drop a zero so if the viral load is a hundred thousand a two log drop would be you just take out two zeros out so it would be one thousand so it would you would expect the patient to go from a hundred thousand to one thousand uh, within the first month and then three to six months um, you should uh, have undetectable viral load because the ARTs that we currently have on the market are highly effective now when it comes to CD4 within the first year it's expected that the patients will gain about 150 to 250 uh, CD4 cells and this levels off beyond two years so this will not continue to go up to normal so the goals of therapy is to have an undetectable viral load and to have CD4 count of at least 500. And that's because typically less than 500 is when opportunistic infections start to emerge. Especially if it's less than 200. Let's take a look at uh, monitoring parameters for HIV. So you can see, uh, so green means that you basically need to uh, get this uh, laboratory parameter for everyone. And yellow means that uh, for some patients, you also may, uh, may need to do that. So at baseline, before we actually start uh, ART, uh, we need to check uh, a viral load, uh, CD4 count. We also need to check HIV resistant to make sure the regimens that we choose initially the, um, you know, are actually working uh, because there's a possibility that the patient can get a resistant strain from uh, somebody else. It's important to uh, check uh, for hepatitis B serology and for hepatitis C. Uh, risk factors for getting HIV are similar to risk factors for getting hep B and hep C so it's important to get these and treat these at the same time as HIV. Urinalysis is important for uh, monitoring the uh, renal function. So for example, you can measure the urine uh, protein as well as uh, urine um, uh, glucose, which normally should not be in, uh, in the urine, uh, but people who have uh, renal dysfunction will have uh, glucose and uh, potentially protein uh, in the urine. So that's an easy way of monitoring renal function. And then uh, for um, more comprehensive uh, monitoring, uh, a basic metabolic uh, panel as well as liver chemistries and uh, complete blood uh, cell count uh, are needed at uh, baseline. And because HIV patients are at risk of cardiovascular disease, it's important to get a baseline fasting lipid panel and a fasting glucose or A1C uh, so that if these are abnormal, uh, they get the appropriate treatment. And if you are to use a Bacavir, you need to get the HLA B5701. If you are not using a Bacavir, this is unneeded. And tropism test is only needed if the patient is to be started on Maravarak. So if the Maravarak is not needed, uh, this test is unnecessary. And then two to eight weeks after ART is initiated, it's important to get the HIV viral load. Um, now, if the patient so viral load is undetectable two to eight weeks then you can monitor it every three to uh, four months however if the viral load is not undetectable two to eight weeks it's important to continue to monitor the viral load more frequently so every four to eight weeks until it's undetectable or at least uh, is less than 200 copies per ml and then you can switch to every three to six months now for patients who actually have uh, good adherence and they have suppressed viral load, uh, you can actually ease, make this easier and do it every six months. But that's only if the patient is adherent and the viral load at uh, this point, it was uh, suppressed. So at, at the very least, the viral load needs to be monitored every six weeks. Uh, and if the patient's treatment uh, fails, it's uh, also important to check the viral load, um, you know, and in, in fact, that's how you would know if the treatment is failing. And of course, situations were clinically indicated. For the CD4 count, once you start uh, ART, it takes about three months for the CD4 cells to increase. So it's unnecessary to get one two to eight weeks later. So typically it's recommended to wait uh, three to six months uh, to get the CD4 and this is only needed if the patient's CD4 count was low or if the viral load is undetectable otherwise if the CD4 count was already high so greater than 300 
and if the viral load is uh, undetectable at 2 to 8 weeks it's unnecessary to continue to monitor cd4 count because there will be no reason for the cd4 count to go any lower now beyond two years if the patient's cd4 count is still low um, uh, if the viral load is suppressed and they are adherent you can actually make that easier and do it every uh, 12 years or annually and of course anytime treatment fails you should uh, check uh, viral load as well as the cd4 count and if uh, as clinically indicated so clinically indicated you know it just depends on the situation you have to use your judgment uh, because we couldn't possibly um, in, or I should say the guideline couldn't include every possible scenario uh, they just have a you know the things that you should check uh, as clinically indicated based on clinical judgment uh, HIV resistance uh, is needed at baseline but then you don't really need to do it unless the patient has treatment failure or you have some reason to believe that there is resistance otherwise it's not really needed uh, the same with hep B and hep C you definitely need it at baseline um, you know, if someone is at risk of getting Hep B or Hep C, and or especially with Hep B, if they're un unvaccinated, it's uh, good to check these annually. Your analysis that you need at baseline for renal function monitoring, you really need to get that every six months if someone is uh, on tenofovir, so either TDF or TAF, because these are nephrotoxic it's important to get your analysis every six months otherwise if someone is not on tenofovir then you need your analysis uh, once a year or every 12 uh, 12 months and if clinically indicated uh, for bmp and liver chemistries uh, you do get them at baseline and then two to eight weeks just to make sure that uh, the patient is tolerating the drugs and then every uh, three to uh, six months uh, just to make sure the uh, the drugs are not causing any toxicity. Uh, with the complete blood count, you do it at baseline, and then uh, any time that you need to get the CD4 count, um, you know, for example, if you do need the CD4 count every three to four months, you also get the CBC. Uh, but at the very least, it's also recommended to get it every six months, and if clinically indicated. Uh, for the fasting lipid panel and um, glucose and A1C, you only need it annually, so at baseline and then every 12 months, unless it's if, if they were abnormal at baseline. So if someone's lipid panels was abnormal, you should do it twice a year. And um, the same with A1C. If A1C was abnormal or glucose, you should do it every three months. Uh, HLA-B57, you really don't need to repeat it once you get it at baseline. And that's only if you need a bokevir. So if a bokevir is not in the picture, you never need the HLA-B 5701. Uh, tropism, uh, you only need it if someone is on Meravirac. If the Meravirac is not in the picture, you never need it. So uh, if you are to use Meravirac, you need it at baseline. And then if the patient has treatment failure, you need to recheck tropism and uh, if uh, clinically need, uh, needed. Uh, you can use uh, Meravirac if the tropism test shows uh, CCR5. Um, not CX uh, CR4. We looked at the mechanism of action of antiretroviral agents and what DHHS guideline recommends for treatment of HIV patients. We ensured adherence to ART is optimized and designed an individualized monitoring plan. Now, given a prescription for antiretroviral agents, provide patient counseling for adverse effects. All right, let's take a look at the food requirements for these various antiretroviral regimens. For many of these regimens, there is no food requirement, meaning that the patients can take them with or without food. However, note that anytime you have elvitegravir, it needs to be taken with food, as well as anytime you have relpeverine in the regimen. So, uh, you know, ODFC and Complera have relpeverine, so it, that requires food. Juluca also has relpeverine, so because of the relpeverine component, uh, food is required and also in general uh, protease inhibitors uh, darunavir and etazanavir they require food uh, so uh, that's to improve absorption efavirenz is the opposite so efavirenz should actually be taken on empty stomach and again for even for efavirenz food will increase absorption but because there are such uh, you know, uh, neuropsychiatric adverse effects with efavirenz. We actually want to minimize the absorption of efavirenz, so that's why it's recommended to take it on empty stomach. In fact, so much so that more recently, a new formulation of uh, efavirenz came to the market with a lower dose. Uh, 
you know, just to uh, make it more tolerable for patients. Let's take a look at the safety profile of some of these combination regimens. So lamivudin is included in Epsicom and it's generally well tolerated as a nuke. It generally can cause, you know, general uh, headache, some uh, GI issues, fatigue, insomnia, and some increases in liver chemistry, but nothing too serious, uh, you know, including rash. So in general, these are very mild and very well tolerated. Now, these are the newest uh, nukes. Some of the oldest the nukes that are no longer used, um, you know, they used to have uh, strong inhi inhibition of DNA polymers in patients, which would lead, lead to lactic acidosis. Uh, so because the mechanism of action is the same, you will see that lactic acidosis uh, will listed in the package insert of any nukes. Uh, but, you know, the risk is very minimal. For a back of year, uh, of course, there is a risk of fatal hypersensitivity syndrome. So it is important for patients to have a HLA B5701 allele. Uh, and, you know, this actually is, uh, you know, 5 to 8% prevalent in um, uh, Caucasian population. Symptoms of this uh, hypersensitivity uh, reaction includes uh, fever, abdominal pain, and rash, and usually uh, is within two weeks of starting a bacavir. But because it can be fatal, if this occurs, it must be discontinued. A bacavir must be discontinued. Another issue with a bacavir is that from observational study, some data have suggested that there is increased risk of MI. Now there is mixed data on this, so it's not clear whether the risk is real or, uh, you know, it's based on biased studies. But because we have so many other options available for patients who are, uh, you know, at risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, it's best to avoid a bacavir because we have so many other options. Let's take a look at uh, Truvada and Descovy. So tenofovir, uh, you know, in general, if this mnemonic helps, there is a NOF in tenofovir. So N for nephrotoxicity, O for osteotoxicity, and F for Fanconi syndrome, which is, uh, you know, basically um, wasting of electrolytes in the kidney. But Fanconi syndrome is very rare. Now, with osteotoxicity, it's important to note that this is actually talking about bone mineral density loss. It is not myelosuppression. Of course, TAF can reduce um, nephrotoxicity and uh, osteotoxicity with tenofovir. And lastly, m uh, has this unique um, adverse effect of hyperpigmentation in addition to uh, GI adverse effects as well as uh, increased mild increase of liver chemistries. With uh, Stribild and Genvoya, which includes Elvitegravir, they should be taken with food. Elvitegravir is generally well tolerated. Uh, one thing that may occur in uh, up to 39% of patients is proteinuria. And the cobicistat component can actually uh, cause a small increase in serum creatinine, um, you know, which can actually artificially uh, lower uh, GFR. We'll talk more about that uh, in a future lecture. Bictegravir does not need boosting, so it's a much smaller pill. So it's very easy to take. It's once a day um, single tablet regimen, and it's very well tolerated. Uh, now, these are the formulations that include dalutegravir. So dalutegravir alone is TVK, and then, uh, you know, with two nuke backbones is Triumec, and then with a single nuke backbone is Dovato. And of course, with a non-nuke, uh, you know, Juluka is Dalutegravir plus a non-nucleal uh, non pavirine. Now, in general, Dalutegravir is uh, well tolerated. Uh, one thing that may occur in some patients is insomnia. And also, Dalutegravir has been associated with weight, weight gain. And in recent time, more, uh, more data has emerged that, uh, you know, this weight gain can be uh, problematic, especially in patients who already, uh, you know, have issues with pain management and are at risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, one thing to note with Dovato, because it has a single agent against uh, hepatitis B, there is a black box warning that if someone does have hepatitis B co-infection, there, uh, there has been lamebudin resistant uh, emerge. Uh, so that's important to screen patients for hep B and uh, make sure that the patients do not have hep B co-infection uh, when using this regimen. Isentris, which is raltegravir, 
Uh, one, th you know, this was one of the oldest integrase inhibitor. The issue is that you have to take it twice a day, so it makes it, um, you know, challenging for adherence. A more uh, recently, a higher dose, so HD is for higher dose, came to the market. So uh, basically, you can do it once a day. But still, this, you know, these are uh, pretty much uh, big pills, and you, the patients have to take two pills uh, once a day. And uh, one unique uh, adverse effect of raltegravir is CPK elevation. So this is, uh, you know, if you remember from daptomycin, can also increase CPK. So that's something to keep an eye on with uh, raltegravir as well. Next, we have cabinubob, which is a combination of cabotegravir, uh, which is an integrase strand transfer inhibitor, and rilpivirine. Now, this is the long-acting version of rilpivirine with a half-life of several weeks. Now, it's uh, co-packaged, it's not co-formulated, it's co-packaged, meaning that there will be two vials in the package. So, there is one vial for uh, cabotegravir and one vial for relpivirin, and uh, the content of the package shows that they actually give you everything you need, including the, um, the syringes and the needles. It, these are intramuscular injections that are injected uh, monthly, and most recently was also approved for, uh, you know, uh, injections every other month and you know this uh, is significant because of the monthly injections or uh, every two months injection it improves it could potentially improve adherence and also it can help with uh, stigma so you know if uh, patients don't want to have a bottle of uh, ART regimen laying around their home and you know they can just get this injection now it is injected into gluteal intramuscular so it's not something that can be done at the community pharmacy so they do need to go to their physicians or other appropriate settings to receive these uh, intramuscular injections now because of the very long half-life of these two agents there is concern that you know if you just inject it into somebody and they're going to have adverse effects or if they don't tolerate it the drug will be in their body for, for a very, very long time. So there was an optional, uh, you know, oral lead-in where you actually give the short-acting version of these drugs, which are PO, uh, and then see if the patients can tolerate it before they transition to the intramuscular injections. Initially, this oral lead-in was required, but more studies came out that they actually found that uh, the injections are very tolerable, so it's really no concern, but you know, that's something that can be discussed with the patient if they're not comfortable uh, You know getting these long-acting agents in case they don't tolerate it uh, There's the option to give the oral version to see if they tolerate it and the oral version is called uh, vocabria now another thing about this regimen is that uh, for patients who are treatment naive, they do need to have uh, their uh, their viral load uh, suppressed before they can get uh, this drug because there's only two agents in there. So essentially, they need to be on another ART regimen and have undetectable viral load before they can uh, switch to this to make sure that resistance doesn't occur. And that's for now. In the future, as more studies come out, uh, that may change in the future. But uh, currently, uh, patients need to be uh, treat it on another regimen and have undetectable viral load before switching to Cabinuva. Now, anytime you have uh, protease inhibitors, so Darunavir and Etazanavir, they have to be taken with food. Darunavir specifically is a sulfa drug, so you know we have discussed sulfa allergy before. It's not necessarily a contraindication, but something to be cautious, you know, be, especially if you have so many other options and you know someone has sulfa allergy, uh, you know, you can. Uh, use uh, something else because adherence is extremely important. So the last thing you want is someone is having a reaction because of this sulfur reaction and they stop taking it. Now with uh, protease inhibitors, typically uh, this lipidemia uh, can occur. So especially increased triglyceride and cholesterol. So that's something uh, to keep an eye on, especially with HIV patients. Uh, you know, HIV HIV itself is a risk factor for cardiovascular uh, disease. Uh, one more thing with etazanavir is that a unique adverse effect is unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, so that's something to monitor when patients are on etazanavir. 
you know, which uh, basically, uh, you know, some of the manifestations is, you know, when they have hyperbilirubinemia, they, they can actually start to look, uh, have a yellowish color. Uh, so, you know, some um, clinicians call this a banana veer, uh, you know, referring to the yellow color. But, you know, given that we have so many other options, they're really not a good reason for people to be on etazanavir uh, anymore. Relpeverine should also be taken with food. Uh, you know, uh, the non-nukes are only active against HIV-1. They don't have activity against HIV-2, uh, you know, which in general is not an issue because HIV-1 is the most, uh, by far the most common um, virus in the U.S., and, uh, you know, it can cause rash, hepatotoxicity, uh, hyperlipidemia. Uh, uh, so this also includes increased in uh, triglyceride as well as increased LDL. Um, and if patients were to overdose or achieve supratherapeutic concentration, it has, uh, relpeverine can also cause QTC prolongation. Efavirenz, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, should be taken on empty stomach because food increases its level to unsafe levels and there are serious adverse effects, so including, uh, you know, uh, depression and suicidality, including people who attempted suicide. So it's a very serious adverse effect. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, important that the patient take it on empty stomach or if they are at, if they already have, uh, you know, psych uh, issues at baseline, you know, in general, it's best to avoid this regimen, but if, you know, there is no other option for the patient, uh, the lower dose is an option. Uh, CNS side effects, uh, you know, occur in up to half of the patients, uh, and basically uh, they resolve after two to four weeks. Uh, so, so, you know, these are general CNS uh, side effects, such as confusion, uh, abnormal dreams, uh, somnolence, impaired concentration, and occasionally severe depression. Now, one thing that also helps with abnormal dreams is if we tell the patient to take this at bedtime, uh, you know, because if you take it uh, in the morning or throughout the day, uh, by the time it's bedtime, uh, the drug is in the system and it can cause uh, vivid dreams. And these dreams are, you know, very problematic. Patients remember them and, uh, you know, it can be uh, very problematic. So one strategy is to, you know, if someone develops um, vivid dreams, to take it at bedtime because by the time the drug kicks in and you have sufficient concentrations in the blood, you know, it's almost morning so the patient is waking up so there is less likely to be, um, you know, those um, vivid abnormal dreams. And lastly, we have Duraverine, uh, which is also a non nuke that was recently came, uh, approved. And it, compared to other non nuke it has improved safety profile, including less neuropsychiatric side effects, um, as well as better lipid profile. In fact, it does not increase LDL and triglyceride. And it's also been shown to, if anything, it's going to reduce or lower LDL and triglyceride levels. And we, it may also, uh, on the other hand, increase HDL uh, level. So, you know, from a lipid profile, uh, it, this drug seems uh, pretty good, uh, you know, given that HIV patients are at risk of cardiovascular disease. The other advantage of this drug is higher barrier to resistance, including it, uh, you know, it has been shown to maintain its activity against uh, viruses that are resistant to efavirenz or uh, relpeverine, for example. Currently, it's uh, considered alternative because of limited data. So it's only been on the market for a couple of years. So, you know, in time, it's likely that, you know, either it becomes, um, you know, first line or, uh, you know, it might find its niche for uh, patients who have resistant developed uh, to other uh, non-nukes. This concludes this presentation. I'm Dr. Fakhtar Obari and this is Human Immunodeficiency Virus in Adults Part 2.
Here are the reliable resources for HIV. In particular, we are going to cover clinical practice guidelines for pre-exposure prophylaxis, which were updated in 2021, just a few months ago. There are also guidelines for post-exposure prophylaxis, one for occupational post-exposure prophylaxis and one for non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, which are pretty similar, uh, but we will only cover one of them in this course. The next learning objective is given a patient at risk for exposure to HIV, recommend appropriate PrEP regimen. The 2021 guidelines for PrEP recommend that all sexually active patients should receive information about pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. And of course, the ultimate goal of PrEP is to prevent the acquisition of HIV inform infection along with its uh, morbidity, mortality, and cost to individuals as well as society. PrEP is recommended for individuals who are at ongoing risk for HIV exposure, either from uh, sexual behaviors or in individuals who inject drugs if they report injection practices that place them at risk. Now, one thing that is important is that acute and chronic HIV, HIV infection must be excluded uh, by symptom history and HIV testing immediately before any pre-exposure prophylaxis regimen is prescribed. So let's take a look at how to exclude HIV. So clinicians should document a negative antibody test result within the seven days before initiating PrEP. And this should be done ideally with an antigen antibody test. And it must be from the blood. So it should be, there should be a blood or serum sample. And it is preferred to have an antigen antibody test uh, that's done in the laboratory. And, and that if that's not uh, available, then a point of care antigen antibody test can be done still on the blood. Now I emphasize that the sample needs to be from the blood because rapid tests that use oral fluids should not be used specifically because they can be less sensitive than blood tests. So there would be a um, high risk of false negative. The guidelines also state that clinicians should not accept patient reported test results or documented anonymous test results. Now let's take a look at the algorithm that's in the guidelines. So this is for people who are not on uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis or any uh, prophylaxis, including post-exposure prophylaxis. So for someone who is about to be initiated for the first time on PrEP, uh, the antibody antigen test is preferred from the blood. And then if the results are positive, of course, this is considered HIV positive, and then they will be excluded from uh, being uh, initiated on pre-exposure prophylaxis. And then if, in fact, this is confirmed to be a true positive, then they need to be transitioned into treatment of HIV. Now for uh, individuals where they either test negative or if there is indeterminate test, the next thing to consider is if the, they have had HIV exposure uh, in, you know, in the past four weeks and if they have signs and symptoms of HIV, acute HIV infection. If the answer is no because the results are either negative or indeterminate, it's uh, um, you know, it's safe to assume the patient does not have HIV and it will be safe for them to initiate PrEP. Now, if the answer uh, to this question is yes, a second test needs to be done from the plasma to confirm the results. So this can be either another antibody antigen uh, assay or it could be uh, an RNA assay, HIV-1 RNA assay. And of course, if the, either of these are positive, the patient is HIV positive. If the, either of them are negative, it would be HIV negative, and then the patient can be started on PrEP. Now for the RNA assay, the level that would be significant would be 200 copies per ml. So if it's the level is less than 200 copies, for example, if it's 150, it could potentially be a false positive. So it is recommended to get another level and find out, uh, you know, if that's uh, a false positive or negative. But in general, if it's at least 200 copies or higher, it's considered a positive result. Now let's take a look at PrEP regimen. In general, there are three groups of individuals who can qualify to receive uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. The first group if, is uh, 
men having sex with men or transgender women having sex with men. The second group is heterosexual men and women. And the last group is uh, persons who inject drugs. Now, in general, we don't have enough data available for uh, PrEP use in transgender men. So that's why they're not included in this, um, uh, in this chart. But uh, for the, the largest group by far is uh, MSM or transgender women having sex with men. So we have two oral options available for this group. So either m uh, plus uh, tenofovir, Desoproxol uh, fumarate, uh, so Truvada, this is once a day daily oral regimen, or uh, the safer option, uh, tenofovir alafenamide in combination with m this is also once a day oral regimen. So these two oral options are available for MSM, uh, but for heterosexual men and women, as well as uh, people who inject drugs, we only have uh, Truvada once a day as an option. So um, uh, Descovy has not been studied in these uh, two, uh, two groups. We also most recently have an injection regimen. So this is cabotegravir. Um, that's intramuscular injection into gluteal muscle. So this is, uh, you know, it, uh, it's not something that can be done at the community pharmacy. So it has to be done at the uh, at the clinic by the physicians, um, so uh, this is a long acting uh, agent. So cabotegravir has a very long half life. So the way the regimen works is that uh, the first injection is done, and then the second injection is done four weeks later. But then thereafter, uh, the injections are every eight weeks. So this is intended to improve adherence, as well as people who do not want to. Uh, take uh, oral regimens daily so you know they just have to get one injection every eight weeks and this will be done by uh, by the clinicians now it is important to know that uh, you should not combine the oral and injectable so patients receive either the uh, IM injections or they can get once a day uh, oral options uh, that I mentioned up here and uh, with the oral options uh, it's recommended to give patients no more than 90 day supply. That way they have to come back for the refill and that, uh, you know, makes sure that uh, the patients receive their follow up. So including HIV uh, testing, uh, because we're not giving a full regimen. This is only two nukes that are used in, uh, um, in prep. So, you know, in case, uh, you know, this prep fails and the patient gets acute HIV, uh, you know, you don't want to have a regimen in those patients with only two nukes because that could lead to resistance. So it's important to check at least every uh, three months, uh, check for HIV. In case the patient tests positive for HIV, they need to be transitioned to a full ART treatment. Now, when considering who will qualify for uh, for receiving PrEP, of course, these are people uh, for these two groups, people who are sexually active, defined as having sex in the past six months. And they also have to be at risk of being exposed to HIV. So if uh, they have any of these, so either HIV positive sexual partner or uh, if they had the bacterial sexually transmitted infection in the past six months uh, or if history of inconsistent or no condom use with sexual partners. And then for persons who inject drugs uh, to qualify for PrEP, uh, they need to have either HIV positive injecting partner or uh, if they participate in sharing injection equipment such as needles that would put them at ongoing risk. So they qualify for uh, receiving PrEP. Now, before uh, we can give these patients uh, PrEP, it is important to document a negative HIV test that's been done in the past seven days as I mentioned before, and also to screen for acute HIV. So, you know, that is to screen for any signs and symptoms of acute HIV. And of course, depending on what regimen it is, they must, of course, not have any contraindications. And for tenofovir, uh, we know that renal function is important. So if somebody is getting a PrEP that includes TAF or tenofovir alafenamide, creatine class must be at least 30. And if it's uh, tenofovir desoproxol fumarate, the creatine clearance has to be at least 60. Now, these cutoffs are specifically for PrEP, 
not for when you use these agents for actual treatment of HIV as part of ART. So there are different uh, cutoffs for creatinine clearance for full treatment, but for the purposes of uh, PrEP, these are the cutoffs. So if somebody's creatinine clearance is 40, for example, they cannot get um, you know, TDF plus m for PrEP, but they do qualify to get TAF plus m And there is no cutoff for cabotegravir. So cabotegravir is a integrase strand transfer inhibitor. It's not uh, renally cleared. Now let's take a look at uh, the options. So in general, efficacy of PrEP, either uh, you know oral or injectable, um, it is dependent on adherence to ensure that plasma drug levels reach a protective level. It's important to note that the time from initiation of PrEP to maximum protection against HIV infection is unknown. So when somebody initiates these, you know, it's not clear if they have the protection immediately or, you know, a few days later. But we do know from pharmacokinetic studies, specifically from Truvada, is that, uh, you know, we get enough concentrations of Truvada in different sites. Uh, so it re really depends on the site. So if it's, for example, people who inject drugs, the site of infection will be blood. So some sources say it will take seven days, others say 20 days. So it's safe to assume that somewhere, uh, you know, in the first, it, it will probably take around two to three weeks before uh, this pre-exposure prophylaxis is fully effective in preventing uh, HIV infection through blood. And that's 20 days in cervical, uh, cervical vaginal tissue. So for women, uh, this makes a women partic uh, you know, um, participating in vaginal intercourse, the cutoff is 20 days. Uh, for rectal tissue, which is the primary route for men having sex with men, as well as also for women, uh, that could be the route of intercourse, so seven days. And, you know, it's, it's um, faster for rectal because these are oral regimens, so, you know, it goes through um, the mouth, all the way through the colon so it goes because these are all regimens they go to the site that's of interest immediately whereas for cervical vaginal tissue it needs to be absorbed first and go into the blood and then blood needs to go to the vaginal tissue and transfuse for this drug to achieve concentration so it's uh, longer it takes longer to get enough concentrations in the vaginal tissue and we don't have any data in as far as penile tissue now, these are based on Truvada when it comes to Descovy, which was approved for PrEP in 2019. Uh, we don't really have the PK data, so it's not clear how long it will take. Uh, you know, if we had to guess, it would probably be similar to uh, Truvada, but the truth is that we just don't know. And as I mentioned before, uh, uh, Descovy has not been approved for heterosexual couples or people who inject uh, drug. It just has not been studied. It has only been studied in MSM or transgender uh, women. And of course, most uh, recently, uh, at the end of 2021, cabotegravir in uh, lung acting was approved for uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, because it, uh, so, so here's the package and it has one vial, so it only has cabotegravir in it. It does not have relpivirin. So relpivirin uh, is only used with this when you have the full treatment, but for pre-exposure prophylaxis, it's only cabotegravir, so only one agent. Now, because it's a long acting, it takes several weeks um, for, for the body to clear this, uh, you know, some patients may, may have concerns about tolerability. So if somebody was to have a bad adverse effect to this, it will, they will have that for several weeks. So there is an optional short acting oral cabotegravir that they can try for four weeks just to make sure they don't have any adverse effects. But this is optional because it is extremely rare for patients to have, uh, you know, um, intolerable adverse reactions to this drug. So that's optional. Um, just like the oral option, the time from initiation of PrEP uh, with this regimen uh, to protection is unknown. So it's not clear how long it would take. Now, because of the long half-life, there is this long tail of gradually declining drug levels. So if somebody wants to come off PrEP, 
uh, then because of the long half-life, they're going to have the drug in their system for a long time, including once it goes subtherapeutic, they will have that subtherapeutic levels for a long time. So if they happen to get HIV infection during that time, they are at high risk of developing drug resistance. So uh, that makes it tricky when somebody discontinues this. Uh, it's probably a good idea to uh, go on oral uh, PrEP if they are to have some uh, exposure to HIV. Of course, if somebody knows for sure they're not going to have exposure to HIV, it's not going to be an issue just discontinuing this. Now, let's look at the follow-up for, uh, uh, for monitoring. So, it is uh, recommended that uh, for all patients to at least every three months to get the HIV testing, as I mentioned before, to make sure that if they test positive, uh, they need to transition. This is uh, primarily based on oral PrEP, so we're talking about uh, Truvada and Descovy. So if uh, they do test positive, they need to be transitioned to ART. And the HIV testing uh, is a combination of antigen antibody and RNA assay, which I'll explain shortly. And then because of the risk factors for getting HIV and STIs are the same, uh, so bacterial STI screening is also recommended. Now it's recommended more frequently for MSM and transgender women, so every three months, whereas for everybody else, bacterial STI screening is recommended every six months. Uh, and of course, as part of these, uh, every three months, uh, it's important to assess signs and symptoms of acute HIV. Uh, as well as side effect assessment, so we can manage side effects to improve adherence. Uh, there could be other reasons for non-adherence, so it's important to do a full adherence assessment uh, and provide support to patients. And uh, depending on what risk factors they have, it's also important to continue to assess those risk factors because, you know, if they don't have those risk factors, uh, then they may not be on, they may not need to be on PrEP continu continuously. So if somebody doesn't have those risky behaviors anymore, they can come off uh, PrEP. And for people who inject drug, it is important to assess uh, access to clean needles and syringe. And it, in fact, it would be important to provide to them uh, clean needles and syringes because if we don't, what ends up happening is that patients just uh, you know, share needles or use, um, you know, dirty needles that they find um, at various places. Of course, for women, it's important to do pregnant uh, pregnancy tests. And now, if somebody is receiving uh, tenofovir-based uh, uh, PrEP, it's important to assess renal function uh, if they are aged uh, 50 years or older or at baseline their cranial clearance is less than 90 the renal function needs to be assessed every six months otherwise if somebody is younger than 50 or if their renal function is greater than 90 at baseline uh, they can just uh, be assessed uh, every 12 months for renal function and then every 12 months also, it is important to assess uh, weight and lip, uh, lipid panel if they are receiving TAFT. So TAFT only, uh, TAFT specifically is associated with weight gain and um, dyslipidemia. So uh, that does not apply to TDF. And lastly, evaluate the need to continue PrEP an uh, annually. For the injectable cabotegravir, which is injected every eight weeks or every two months, again, uh, at uh, one month after the first injection, it's important to uh, get HIV testing as well as uh, checking for acute HIV and assess risky behaviors. And then every two months, and the reason these are shorter follow-ups is because they match the time that the patient has to come back to the clinic to get the injections. So essentially, these are every two month injections. So if the patient is coming back to the clinic to get the injections, then there's opportunity to do HIV testing and make sure that they have access to clean needles and all the other things that we need to do. So at every four months, it's important to get uh, STI screening for MSM. Every six months, uh, STI screening for everybody else. Every 12 months, assess uh, desire to continue injections. So in other words, uh, you know, PrEP is kind of like 
uh, birth control. So, you know, people don't need to be on it for forever. But as long as they have risk of being exposed, you know, the same way that, you know, for pregnant, uh, for um, for birth control, as long as somebody doesn't want to be pregnant, they receive birth control, but it's not for life. The same applies to PrEP. As long as somebody is at risk of being exposed to HIV, they need uh, they can be on PrEP. But if those risk factors go away, for example, let's say they stop injecting drug or if they uh, change their partner and they're no longer being exposed to a sexual partner with HIV, then they no longer need to be on PrEP. And that's something that needs to be assessed every 12 months. Now, those follow-ups, it is recommended to do both antigen antibody testing and RNA assay. And that's important uh, to, uh, uh, to reduce the risk of false negative and false positive. So if both of them agree, the results of both of these tests agree. So either if both of them are positive, you assume the patient has HIV. If both of them are negative, HIV negative. But if, th if there is discordant between the two tests, either you know, one or the other is positive and negative, uh, then a new plasma specimen uh, needs to be sent for RNA assay specifically. And then based on that uh, confirmation, um, it's either HIV positive or HIV negative. Now, for, when it comes to adherence assessment and support, there are several approaches that can be effective. One is educating patients about their medications helping them ante uh, anticipate and manage side effects, asking about adherence, uh, success, and issues at follow-up visits. So, for example, you can say something like, many people find it difficult to take a medicine every day. Thinking about the last week, on how many days have you not taken your medicine? So this is asking, uh, well, first of all, you make sure that the patient feels safe. So by making it, uh, you know, non-judgmental that this can happen to a lot of people. And then secondly, asking an open-ended question so the patient can, uh, can open up about their adherence. And helping them establish uh, dosing routines that uh, mesh with their work and social schedules. And providing a reminder system and tools. Addressing uh, financial substance use disorder or mental health needs uh, that may uh, impede adherence and facilitating social support. And of course, uh, one uh, counseling point is patients should be told to take a single missed dose as soon as they remember it, unless it is almost time for the next dose. If it's time for the next dose, they can just skip it and continue the regular dosing schedule. Please pause this video and, re, uh, and review these key components of oral medication adherence counseling. Lastly, the Senate Bill 159 in California uh, was, uh, came into effect in July of 2020. And this is important because uh, this new addition to the bill uh, essentially lets uh, a pharmacist furnish uh, or dispense HIV PrEP as well as HIV post-exposure prophylaxis. In this part, uh, I'm going to focus on the pre-exposure prophylaxis. And the bill says a pharmacist shall complete a training program approved by the board, which uh, we provide that uh, uh, here in the school uh, through this course. And then a pharmacist shall furnish at least a 30-day supply and up to a 60-day supply of PrEP if all of the following conditions are met. Now, this is a slightly different than the guideline because the guideline, which is in general for physicians, uh, you know, <clears throat> the limit is up to 90 days. Uh, for a pharmacist, it is up to a 60 day supply, but at least a 30 day supply until, uh, and this is essentially to link them to care so they can follow up with the primary care physician. Now, it is important before a pharmacist can furnish it to make sure the patient is HIV negative. And this must be based on blood, not the oral uh, saliva test. And it must be within the past seven days. Uh, no self-reported uh, signs or symptoms of acute infection. No currently taking contraindicated medications. And the pharmacist provides counseling to the patient on the ongoing use of PrEP, which may include education about side effects, safety during pregnancy and breastfeeding, adherence to recommended dosing, and the importance of timely testing and treatment as applicable for HIV, renal function, 
Hep B, Hep C, STIs, and pregnancy for individuals of childbearing capacity. And the pharmacist shall notify the patient that the, pa uh, the patient must be seen by a primary care provider to receive subsequent prescriptions for PrEP and that the pharmacist may not furnish a 60-day supply of PrEP to a single patient more than once every two years. And the pharmacist initiating or furnishing PrEP shall not permit the person uh, to whom the drug is furnished to waive the uh, consultation required by the board. So they cannot waive all of this information. You are required to provide all this education to the patient. We looked at CDC recommendations for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, given an HIV-exposed patient, recommend appropriate post-exposure prophylaxis regimen or PEP. When it comes to post-exposure prophylaxis, there are two different guidelines. There is one that's occupational post-exposure prophylaxis or OPEP, which primarily refers to uh, the healthcare setting. For example, if you get a, a needle stick, there is also non-occupational po post-exposure prophylaxis. So things like sexual assault uh, or unprotected sex or uh, uh, you know exposure to injection uh, drug use. We will focus on non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. The recommendations are basically identical. So the post-exposure prophylaxis should be started as soon as possible. However, it should not be started beyond 72 hours. So it's only effective as long as it's started within 72 hours. And because this is post-exposure, so possibly the virus could be inside the, the patient's body. Therefore, uh, as opposed to pre-exposure prophylaxis, which was just the backbone, the post-exposure prophylaxis includes the full treatment. So you need the backbone, which is typically ten tenofovir, uh, desoproxol, and tricytobine, plus a third agent, which is either raltegravir or dalutegravir. And alternatively, this third agent could be darunavir uh, boosted with ritonavir. So these are the agents that have been studied, so that's why uh, we shouldn't use anything else. For example, Bictegravir and uh, Elvitegravir have not been studied for post-exposure prophylaxis. So our options are Raltegravir and Dalutegravir and Darunavir. Another thing to note is that Raltegravir uh, twice a day dosing is studied for post-exposure prophylaxis. So the more recent formulation of Raltegravir that's dosed once daily should not be used for, uh, for PEP. It's only for treatment of HIV. And lastly, uh, the new formulation of Tenofovir, TAF, uh, which recently got uh, indication for PrEP, it's uh, not indicated for post-exposure prophylaxis. So it has not been studied for PEP uh, as of yet. So therefore, uh, we have to use uh, Truvada as the backbone plus a third agent. And of course, we don't use a bakavir based backbone because there is no time to check for HLA B5701. We got to start treatment within 72 hours. And the treatment is for 28, uh, 28 days. So this is fixed. So we just treat uh, for 28 days uh, and hopefully, uh, after four weeks, the patient will not develop HIV infection. As always, it's important to provide education to the patient regarding adverse effects, as well as checking for uh, potential drug-drug interactions. So basically, when someone gets exposed uh, to the virus, uh, of course, if the, uh, you know, the risk is negligible, the PEP is not uh, needed. But if there is a reasonable um, evidence that the patient has been exposed to the HIV, uh, if it's been more than 72 hours since exposure, then PEP is not recommended. We'll just wait to check for HIV and if the patient develops HIV, you just treat the HIV because uh, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis will not be effective. But if it's been less than 72 hours, now post-exposure prophylaxis will be very effective. So there's potential to prevent HIV infection. Now, uh, if we do know the source, so for example, if somebody uh, had unprotected sex uh, with someone, um, you know, we can potentially uh, test the source and see if they're HIV positive or HIV negative. So if someone happens to be HIV positive, then definitely we get we start post-exposure prophylaxis. 
Um, and then if we don't know the source, uh, for example, in cases of sexual assault or rape, uh, we just have to go case by case uh, basis. In most cases, we would actually go ahead and uh, do post exposure prophylaxis. Now, when it comes to monitoring for post exposure prophylaxis, so if we do know the source of the infection, uh, you know, it's helpful to check for HIV to see if the source actually had HIV because if they didn't, then uh, post exposure prophylaxis will be unlikely and then some of the other things that uh, kind of uh, can be transmitted in the same way such as hep B, hep C and some of the sexually transmitted infections like uh, chlamydia, um, gonorrhea and syphilis uh, these should be also tested um, in the source and then in the patient who was exposed also they need to be tested for HIV as well as for hep B, hep C and uh, sexually transmitted infections. And then because we are to start post-exposure prophylaxis, we also need the uh, serum creatinine and uh, liver chemistries because we're going to use Truvada and, um, you know, depending on whether you use Raltegravir, Dalutegravir or Darunavir, these will be used for monitoring. And then in four to six weeks, uh, we check for HIV again. That, uh, that will be at the end of treatment. So treatment is basically for four weeks or 28 uh, days. So we check one last uh, one, uh, one more time. And then one last time we check HIV three months after exposure just to make sure that uh, post-exposure prophylaxis actually worked. So if this one comes out to be negative, we know that post-exposure prophylaxis worked and the patient did not get HIV. On the other hand, if this test positive, uh, then unfortunately the patient is diagnosed with HIV and then they need to go on lifetime uh, treatment. Uh, now one scenario where you would uh, need to check HIV uh, six months after exposure if someone uh, also get test positive for hep, uh, for hep C because it's been shown that people who have hep C um, while they were uh, exposed to HIV the seroconversion, uh, meaning uh, development of antibodies, uh, will be delayed. So you would be detecting that at six months. So that's the only time you would uh, get it at six months. And of course, uh, in uh, females of reproductive age, uh, we also check for pregnancy at baseline and then at the, at the end of treatment. And that's really uh, just to make sure that uh, we um, do a better job of follow-up because if the patient does develop HIV, they can uh, the patient can uh, transmit the virus to the uh, to the fetus now depending on the situation on how the patient got exposed to the uh, to to the virus for example if it was unprotected sex um, and the patient if the patient has that risky behavior frequently it might be a good uh, you know intervention to transition uh, from pep to prep so once we complete the 28 days of post-exposure prophylaxis you know we can have a conversation with the patient after if, if they think that they will continue the risky behavior after PEP if the PEP was successful and the patient did not develop HIV infection then upon a negative HIV test we can actually give patient PrEP so you know depending on whether you gave patient a PEP formulation um, either uh, you know raltegravir with truvada or dalutegravir with truvada or uh, darunavir with uh, truvada this will be for 28 days and then after 28 days you just give them truvada as prep and they will be on truvada as long as they continue the risky behavior now the senate bill 159 sb 159 that will be uh, effective july 2020 uh, expanded services of pharmacists uh, to HIV PrEP as well as HIV PEP. So pharmacies can uh, furnish HIV post-exposure prophylaxis starting July of 2020 uh, as long as the pharmacy gets a training in it. So typically, uh, I imagine a one-hour CE will be required or, or maybe if, um, more CEs. Uh, but most importantly, the pharmacists can furnish a complete course. Uh, now, they don't specify what complete course is, but they do say that, uh, you know, they will be referring to the CDC uh, non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis guideline, which would define the complete course as 28 days. So what they really mean here is a 28-day course of post-exposure prophylaxis. 
and then uh, they follow the same uh, requirements as the CDC guidelines. So, so, so it has to be within 72 hours of exposure. And uh, just like PrEP, you know, the pharmacy is required to uh, provide the full counseling to the patient, uh, including transition to PrEP. And uh, the patient may not actually waive this consultation. So it's actually required. We looked at CDC recommendations for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis as well as CDC's recommendation for post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, given an HIV patient case, evaluate and manage common drug-drug interactions. So when it comes to the pharmacokinetic boosters, we have cobicisan and ritonavir. Cobicisan is actually not an HIV drug, so it has no activity against HIV. Ritonavir itself is a protease in HIV protease inhibitor. However, uh, we actually don't use it for its protease uh, inhibition because we use a lower dose. It's such a potent inhibitor of these enzymes that we actually use it at suboptimal doses. So the doses, uh, you know, 100 milligram of ritonavir is not enough to be active against HIV, but 100 milligram is such a potent uh, um, in inhibitor of these enzymes that, uh, you know, we actually use it to boost uh, the concentrations of other protease, well, protease inhibitors. So you can see there are some differences between the two. Uh, one thing in particular about uh, cobicistad is that it can actually artificially cre uh, increase serum creatinine and that's because it, uh, it actually inhibits some of the uh, secretion of uh, serum creatinine. So it really does nothing to the GFR. So, you know, obviously integrase uh, strand transfer inhibitors are primarily the first line agents that we use for treatment of HIV. So currently we have four on the market, raltegravir, dalutegravir, elvitegravir, and bigtegravir. Uh, elvitegravir is the only one is the only one that needs to be taken with food. They're pretty much all taken daily. Up until recently, raltegravir had to be taken twice a day, but now uh, there's a new higher dose of it that you can actually take once a day. Uh, in particular, elvitegravir and bigtegravir are actually substrates of 3A4. So uh, elvitegravir itself actually needs to be boosted. So cobicista will inhibit CYP3A4. So as a result, you will need less of elvitegravir. So the pills will be smaller, and also with the half life that's uh, you know a little shorter, 13 hours, uh, you can still dose elvitegravir once a day because of that pharmacokinetic booster. Now, bigtegravir, although it is a substrate of 3A4, it does not need uh, boosting. So, you know, you need smaller doses of bigtegravir, so 50 milligrams, so also the pill is smaller than elvitegravir, so that's another reason that uh, boosting was not needed for bigtegravir, because for 50 milligrams, the pill was small enough, whereas elvitegravir, even with a booster, you, you still need 150 milligrams. So if you didn't have that booster, you would probably need uh, several times 150 milligrams. So when it comes to drug interactions, elvitegravir will have the most, not because of elvitegravir itself, but because it has to come with cobicistat. So cobicistat will cause a lot of drug interactions, whereas the rest of them don't have a pharmacokinetic uh, booster. One thing that bigtegravir and dalutegravir have in common is that they both inhibit OCT2. OCD2. And one thing that's important is metformin is actually a substrate of OCT2. So OCT2 is a, you know, it's actually the, uh, its function is to actually secrete uh, metformin. So because they inhibit, uh, you will see uh, metformin levels increased. So that would be a uh, significant drug inter interaction because you will see a lot of diabetic patients on metformin. Bigtegravir also inhibits uh, MATE1. So let's uh, look at some clinically significant uh, drug interaction. So all integrase strand transfer inhibitors will interact with uh, cations like uh, ant antacids. So any uh, polyvalent cation containing like uh, aluminum or uh, calcium, uh, they will actually bind to integrase inhibitors and will prevent their absorption. So for that reason, 
anything that contains a polyvalent cation should be avoided uh, or, or actually should be spaced out by two hours. So two hours before or after uh, you give uh, integrase uh, strand transfer inhibitors. So all of them, all four of them will interact with antacids or not just antacids, anything that has, so if you were giving calcium pills or you know anything that has a polyvalent cation. Uh, one thing that uh, big tegravir and dalutegravir have in common is that they both uh, will interact with metformin and dofetolite. So, uh, so when he says avoid, when I say avoid, I actually mean contraindicated. So, dofetolite is actually contraindicated with uh, big tegravir and dalutegravir. Uh, metformin is not a contraindication, so you just adjust the dose. Now there's a really good chance that cobicistat may also interact with dofetolite. However, it's not in the package insert at the at the time at the moment. So they may just not have studied it, but be be careful with cobicistat and dofetolite. I didn't see it in the package insert, but I suspect cobicistat will also interact with dofetolite. Uh, Bictegravir is also contraindicated with uh, rifampin because rifampin is a strong inducer of CYP3A4 and Bictegravir is a substrate, so rifampin should be avoided. With Elvitegravir, it's uh, recommended to avoid uh, anything that's a substrate of CYP3A4, like uh, uh, these uh, statins are actually substrates of CYP3A4, and because cobicistat is a strong inhibitor, it's, it's actually contraindicated to use these two. It is okay to use atorvastatin. Uh, the same goes with uh, salmutrol. And then rifampin, of course, is a strong inducer of cyp 3 4 That actually, because you actually need a pharmacokinetic booster for vitegravir, so cobicisa is a strong inhibitor of cyp 3 4 and rifampin is a strong inducer, so you, you should... Uh, it's actually contraindicated to use rifampin because it will mess up l um levels. The same with some of the uh, anticonvulsants like phenytoin, they're also inducers, so pretty much most inducers of cyp 3 should not be used with l because it needs help from a pharmacokinetic booster. And then of course because of cobicistat, uh, sh patients uh, you sh sh use uh, caution with hormonal contraceptives because cobicista can inhibit and uh, cause uh, failure of uh, hormonal contraceptives. Uh, when it comes to protease inhibitor, of course, uh, these are the three most common protease inhibitors and of course they're boosted and the reason they're, they can be boosted is because they're all substrates of 3A4 so they're not usually renally cleared and uh, for non-nukes so efavirenz uh, and rilpivirenz are the two common ones that you use um, etravirin actually uh, for for food, you should take it after after each meal. Food can actually increase etrovirin by fifty percent, so it's recommended to take it after meals. It doesn't necessarily mean empty stomach, but it just says uh, take it after meals rather than with food. Now these are all CYP3A4 substrates. Uh, one thing that's special about efavirenz is that it's actually an inducer of three uh, CYP3A4. So you will also see a lot of drug in interactions with uh, efavirenz. So for protease inhibitors here uh, and uh, rilpivirin, here are some uh, sig uh, clinically significant drug interactions. So again, because uh, protease inhibitors are boosted, uh, you should avoid uh, substrates of CYP3A4. So here are the three statins that uh, are substrates of uh, CYP3A4. Atorvastatin also has a separate mechanism of clearance, so it's not as strong. So it's only listed here for uh, because it's in the package insert for uh, etazanavir, uh, boosted etazanavir, but it's okay to use atorvastatin with uh, darunavir. There are also uh, uh, hepatitis C protease inhibitors that are also substrates of uh, CYP3A4, so they should be avoided because these are boosted and 
the boosting will affect the levels of hep C drugs. And the same can be said about uh, salmeterol. Now, etazanavir and rilpivirine both need an acidic environment for absorption. So, with etazanavir and with rilpivirine, it's uh, uh, you should actually avoid uh, proton pump inhibitors because it, they need the acidic environment. Let's take a look at some common drug interactions. When it comes to drug interactions, you will see that the majority of significant drug interactions are with boosted regimens, so either boosted protease inhibitors, so etazanavir, darunavir, and lopinavir are boosted with ritanavir or with cobicistat. And of course, lytegravir is the only integrase strand transfer inhibitor that's boosted with cobicistat. And because these pharmacokinetic boosters uh, are CYP enzyme inhibitors, uh, they lead to significant um, drug interactions. Now, when it comes to uh, corticosteroids, you will see that uh, beclometazone, which is available as both the nasal formulation as well as inhalation, uh, is uh, pretty much safe to take with any regimen. Now, uh, for the sake of this discussion, we're going to ignore any topical formulations. Budesonide is available, as, uh, is available as inhaled and intranasal formulation, uh, but it is also available as uh, systemic formulation, so it can be taken orally. And you will see that it's contraindicated with uh, any pharmacokinetic booster. So it's not, um, you know, it should be avoided with the boosted PIs as well as elvitegravir. Now, it does interact with efavirenz because efavirenz is an inducer. Uh, but it's not really contraindicated. So you just have to monitor and make adjustments to the dose of budesonide. Now, systemic dexamethasone itself is a um, inducer, so it can actually reduce the um, concentration of protease inhibitors and elvitegravir. So, um, you know, it should be monitored and uh, those, those adjustments must be made. But this, the interaction is significant with, uh, with relpivirine, so it actually should be avoided with uh, relpivirine. Now, fluticasone is available as inhaled and intranasal, and uh, both the routes are actually contraindicated with uh, boosted PI or boosted elvitegravir. Uh, Mometazone as well is available as in intranasal or inhaled formulation and uh, both routes are contraindicated with cobicistat and with uh, boosted uh, protease inhibitors. Uh, prednisone is systemic and um, it does interact but it's not contraindicated with uh, boosted regimens and efavirenz. Uh, Salmetrol is inhaled uh, while it does interact it's not contraindicated so anything that's uh, yellow it potentially in interacts, but it's not contraindicated, whereas uh, the red boxes are contraindicated and should be avoided. Uh, and the green, of course, means uh, no, no significant interactions. Now, triamcinolone is also available as inhaled or intranasal. Uh, it does interact with uh, boosted regimens and efavirenz, but it's not recommended. Of note, triamcinolone, um, fluticasone and budesonide are also available over the counter as intranasal formulations. So as pharmacists, it is very important to provide education to patients who can easily walk, um, you know, to the shelves and grab any over the counter products. So if they are on uh, these boosted regimens, it's important to let them know that uh, you know, fluticasone and budesonide over the counter are contraindicated, and triamcinolone would be the safer option uh, should they need uh, intranasal um, corticosteroids for seasonal allergies, for example. Um, so, that's an important education to provide to patients. Now, when it comes to some of the cardiovascular agents uh, of note, amlodipine and uh, deltaizam are two commonly used uh, calcium channel blockers. Uh, because um, they are also substrates of CYP enzymes, they do interact with boosted regimens as well as uh, efavirenz. However, they are not contraindicated, so you just have to monitor the patient's uh, blood pressure and um, heart rate with uh, deltaizam 
and make adjustments to the dose of amlodipine and diltiazem based on their blood pressure and heart rate. Okay, so we are here at the local Walmart. We're gonna go check out the pharmacy. You know where the pharmacy is? Okay. Okay, so I'm looking for over-the-counter allergy relief. Okay, so they have Flonase and nasal cord. Oh, Cecilia, you're here. Um, I have an HIV patient who's taking boosted regimen. They want Flonase. What do you think? No, that's a terrible idea. Flonase will interact with boosted regimen and non-nukes. Oh, what should I do then? Go this way. Nasacort. Nasacort? Yes. Oh, thank you. I'm here to help you. When it comes to hormonal contraceptive, <coughs> contraceptives, contraceptives, uh, CPTRA4 has a role, so uh, both efavirenz and uh, ritonavir can affect the levels of uh, progestins. So because of that, it is recommended to um, use additional contraceptive methods uh, when the patient is uh, actually taking uh, efavirenz or uh, boosted uh, regimens. So with these, uh, they're not really they're not really contraindications, but you know it's important to let the patient know that these can make uh, hormonal contraceptives uh, ineffective or less effective. So. Uh, they should use alternative uh, methods of uh, contraception. So primarily with boosted and efavirenz. So as I mentioned before with uh, statins, uh, basically the three statins that go through CYP3A4 are listed here, but atorvastatin in particular doesn't primarily depend on 3A4, so uh, you know, historically Atorvastatin was considered a drug interaction with anything that affected 3A4, but nowadays uh, we have data that uh, atorvastatin is not as much affected. So, uh, you know, the only exception is that uh, with uh, with uh, etazanavir, uh, atorvastatin is actually contraindicated. But with uh, 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 you know, with darunavir, for example, they just recommend the maximum dose. But it's okay to use atorvastatin with darunavir. So these two contraindicated with uh, anything that has cobicistat or retoner. So any anything that's boosted. We looked at pre-exposure and post-exposure regimens. We evaluated drug-drug interactions. Now, given a patient case where an adult patient with HIV is experiencing intolerable adverse effects, recommend appropriate management. So when it comes to adverse effects, uh, of course, our uh, the the newest uh, nukes actually are generally well tolerated, whereas the older nukes had uh, severe toxicity. So mostly because of mitochondrial toxicity. So zidovudine, which is one of the oldest ones from the 80s, and we still use it because it's available in IV formulation, and also we have uh, significant data in pregnancy. Uh, so it has all of those uh, terrible side effects that all the old nukes have. Now with Abacavir, of course, you can have a hypersensitivity reaction, so it's important to check for HLA B5701 uh, polymorphism. Uh, TDF is nephrotoxic and uh, bone uh, mineral uh, loss, so osteotoxicity. And TAF is an improved version of TDF, so it's well tolerated. So it, it can still cause some nephrotoxicity and bone mineral loss, but it's not to the extent of TDF. And uh, emtricitabine can also cause um, hyperpigmentation. So when when it comes to so you can see they have looked at the bone mineral density over 48 uh, weeks in different studies, and they can see like uh, you know how much. Uh, 
bone mineral density loss has occurred once the drugs have been studied. So you can see that most bone mineral density loss occurs in, in the studies that actually has TDF. So tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, you can see all these yellow uh, or orange, I guess, all these orange lines. There's, there's significantly more bone mineral loss, uh, whereas uh, when we change that TDF to TAF, you know, TAF is significantly less bone mineral loss compared to the other formulation that have uh, TDF. Now, with the integrated strand transfer inhibitors, which are first-line recommended regimens, are pretty well tolerated in general, and that's so they are both effective and well tolerated, and they actually do pretty well against resistance. So that's why they are recommended first-line. Uh, one thing about raltegravir, it can actually increase uh, uh, creatinine, uh, creatinine uh, phosphate kinase, or CPK. With elvitegravir, you can actually see proteinuria. And when it comes to uh, boosted uh, protease inhibitors, uh, darunavir is well tolerated. Uh, lopinavir is a is an is a relatively older protease inhibitor, so you will see more uh, more uh, adverse effects, especially uh, some changes on EKG. Uh, etazanavir can actually cause jaundice, so in a lot of areas they actually call it bananavir. So banana beer because it, you know it's common to see jaundice in patients. So because of that, because of toxicity, actually, uh, these two agents are not used as much anymore. Uh, darunavir is better tolerated. So should we need protease inhibitor? You know, typically darunavir is the drug of choice, and the reason we would need protease inhibitor is because they actually do uh, significantly better against resistant HIV. Uh, even compared to second generation uh, integrase inhibitors. So they are, you know, typically when patients uh, experience uh, treatment failure because of resistance, protease inhibitors are uh, drugs that we go to. Uh, uh, but, you know, because of these side effects we uh, and also drug interactions, we don't use them initially in someone who's treatment naive. So with the non nukes the two that you will commonly see will uh, are uh, efavirenz and rilpivirin. Uh, rilpivirin is actually well tolerated. Uh, the reason we don't use it first line is because for rilpivirin to be effective, the CD4 count needs to be uh, greater than 200 and a viral load less than 100,000 at baseline to start it. So that's uh, you know considering how many other options we have. Uh, that's a lot of uh, things to look at, so Rilpivirin is not uh, first line anymore. But the Favirenz actually has CNS toxicity. So one thing that a lot of patients will complain about is vivid dreams. So they could be so much that this, uh, that the patient can act will actually stop taking it. Now, a lot of for a lot of patients, these are supposed to go away after two to four weeks of treatment. But you know, if they persist after four weeks then it's a good idea to switch them to something else because as time goes on, this can lead to non-adherence. Another thing that's important, this CNS toxicity can also uh, cause uh, suicidal ideation. And that's actually the primary reason efavirenz is not first line anymore because it actually increased uh, the odds of uh, com uh, su uh, suicide uh, attempt and uh, completion. As I mentioned earlier, cobicista can actually uh, uh, block uh, MATE1 or MAT1, and MAT1 can actually secrete creatinine. So by blocking this, it artificially uh, decreases. Uh, I'm sorry, artificially increases the levels of creatinine in the level uh, in the blood. So it doesn't really change uh, GFR, but it can artificially increase serum creatinine. So here are some. Uh, uh, some numbers. So cobicista, because it increases serum creatinine, if you're using Cockcroft galt equation to calculate creatinine clearance, you will automatically get the number that's 15, can be up to 15 uh, milliliters per minute or lower. So, now rilpivirin and dolutegravir also have some, uh, they, they also can increase serum creatinine. So, 
keep that in mind. So when it comes to different regimens, you it's important to consider renal function. So this is creatine clearance cutoff. So for um, LY tegravir, uh, could be cystadem tricytobin, whether it's uh, with uh, I'm sorry, uh, with uh, TDF, so this is uh, stribuild. So with stribuild, uh, it's actually, so if the patient uh, creatinine clearance is less than 70, uh, it's not recommended to initiate it. So for to in order to start stribuild, which has both cob cystad and TDF, which can affect uh, creatinine clearance, uh, it has to be greater than 70. Now, if it's somebody's creatinine clearance is, uh, you know, 72, and you start it and it goes to 65, uh, you can continue, but if it goes below 50, if it goes below 50, then it's recommended to discontinue, and that's in the package insert. Now, with the uh, darunavir could be cystad and uh, TDF, uh, the cutoff is also 70, but uh, they don't really say anything about, uh, you know, once it goes less than 70, uh, so uh, so once it goes less than 70, you have to discontinue it because it doesn't have uh, a statement about going less than 50. But with Stribal, definitely you can continue until it's less than 50. Once it's less than 50, you discontinue. But with Darunavir, Kobe says that once it's less than 70, uh, you discontinue. So you can see the cutoff for some of the other agents. So for most of them, uh, you know, whether it's TDF or dolutegravir, it's 50. Uh, if you use the TAF formulation, anything with TAF, whether there is cob cystad or not, with TAF, the cutoff is 30. So, uh, you know, definitely that improved it. And uh, most recently, we have the combination that doesn't have the backbone. So there is no TDF or TAF. So, the, uh, so we have a dolutegravir with uh, rolpivirine, and renal function doesn't matter. So for these combination, it, you can use it at any creatinine clearance. So should someone need uh, a reason to change um, their ART, you know, whether it's because of intolerable adverse effects or because the renal function got worse or, uh, you know, whatever the reason, these are, there are some basic principles that should be considered when switching, uh, you know, in, in patients who are virologically suppressed on the current regimen. So one thing, so although they may be virologically suppressed on the current reg regimen, it's important to review their past history to make sure they didn't have resistance to regimens in the past. So if they did have resistance in the past, you want to avoid those agents. Uh, if, the, if they have had resistance in the past, it's uh, important to consult an expert. Uh, generally speaking, switching within the same class is not an issue. So, you know, if someone didn't uh, tolerate efavirenz and you were to switch them to rolpivirin, it will be okay. Uh, however, if uh, you know switching between classes is a little more tricky, so you really have to know what you're doing. So, for example, if someone is on a protease inhibitor and you're about to switch them to a non-NUC, so if someone is on darunavir and you're about to switch them to efavirenz, uh, uh, you have to be careful and make sure that uh, it will still be susceptible to uh, to efavirenz because you're switching between class. Uh, but generally speaking, you know it's you know, it is possible to switch between classes if you don't have reason to believe that it will be resistant. We looked at CDC recommendation for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis. We evaluated and managed common drug-drug interactions and we looked at patients who experienced intolerable adverse effects and how to manage them. Now, let's educate an HIV patient on important lifestyle modifications. So now that we have really good potent uh, HIV regimens, uh, our HIV patients are actually living longer. So now we have been able to actually study and see, uh, you know, how how does aging affect HIV patients? Because before, patients would die within 10 years of having HIV. So we couldn't do these studies before. In fact, you can see that in the in the 1990s, a lot of patients would die as they age, like very quickly. And then, you know, throughout the 2000s, as we improve treatment, uh, you know, more and more patients are actually uh, living longer compared compared to the 
uh, non-HIV infected patients. And this was this was a study from Denmark. These comorbidities include uh, hypertension, which is the most common one, but also you can see HIV patients are more likely to have MI. So when you compare, uh, so orange is HIV infected, blue is HIV uninfected, you can see significant difference in MI. Uh, but also peripheral arterial disease, uh, when you, can, uh, you know, also CKD. So factors related to non-AIDS uh, comorbidities, you know, obviously aging is a huge part of it, but, you know, unfortunately we cannot do anything about aging. And then the other thing is that chronic HIV infection will lead to um, chronic inflammation. So even in patients who have undetected viral load, there will be chronic inflammation. And as we know, um, in, you know, inflammation can lead to fibrosis and uh, multi-organ uh, uh, damage over over many years. Uh, there's ART toxicity, so you know whether it's uh, TDF causing bone toxicity or um, nephrotoxicity. That's something important for for the pharmacist to monitor. So if someone is losing bone density, you know you may want to intervene uh, and switch them from TDF to TAF or other regimens that uh, are not. Uh, as toxic. Another thing is that uh, these patients, uh, based on their risk factors, they could also be co-infected with other viruses uh, such as hepatitis C. Uh, of course, obesity, exercise, and di diet and smoking are the most important lifestyle modifications. And the reason is HIV patients are at higher risk of having cardiovascular disease. And because of that, these risk uh, these are things that are um, associated with cardiovascular disease. So uh, it is extremely important to provide education to HIV patients who would benefit from weight loss. Uh, it's important for them to exercise, and it's important to also give them education about diet. In fact, most H most HIV uh, clinics actually have a dietitian as part of the team, so that they actually get a a comprehensive education uh, about diet. So dietitians have an important role uh, in the care of the HIV patient. Now, when it comes to, you know, like, so you can provide education for uh, weight loss, exercise, diet, and smoking. The most important out of all of this is uh, smoking. So these things can lead to inflammation, uh, you know, this lipidemia, in insulin resistant, and the, uh, decreased physical functioning, which over time can lead to end organ disease such as cardiovascular disease, um, you know, CKD, uh, metabolic uh, syndrome, and neuropsychiatric uh, dysfunction. Again, uh, most ART agents are uh, generally well tolerated. Uh, when it comes to NRTIs or NUCs, uh, you know, older NRTIs are more likely to cause dyslipidemia. Uh, you know, newer uh, NRTIs are less likely to cause dyslipidemia. TAF, in particular, can increase uh, triglyceride, LDL, and HDL. Um, you know, but overall, the ratio of total cholesterol to HDL is not changed. Newer NRTIs are unlikely to cause insulin resistance. Um, of course, we have discussed that TDF can, uh, you know, reduce bone mineral density and TAF uh, significantly uh, less likely to, to do this. And when it comes to bone marrow suppression, this per specifically happens with older NRTIs. So Zydovudine is one of the older um, NRTIs that we still have on the market. And then with cardiovascular disease, Bacavir is associated with MI, which is kind of controversial because FDA has not found a correlation between Abacavir and MI, whereas some observational studies have. When it comes to integrase inhibitors, um, the boosted Elvitegravir is also likely to increase uh, triglyceride, LDL, and HDL, but it doesn't really cause anything else. Uh, protease inhibitors, uh, especially the older ones, uh, were associated with uh, dyslipidemia. Uh, darunavir and etazanavir are, um, you know, they can still increase um, triglyceride, LDL, and HDL, but not as much as some of the older uh, protease inhibitors. And then uh, with uh, NNRTIs or non-NUCs, efavirenz in particular can uh, slightly increase triglyceride, LDL, and HDL. 
So in the 2018 American Heart Association guidelines for cholesterol management, they actually uh, added uh, HIV patients as one of the risk factors for having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So they did say that for patients who are uh, 40 to 75 years of age with LDL 70 to 189, and this is in the absence of um, you know, uh, car uh, clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in the absence of diabetes. Uh, so if someone doesn't have those things, and LDL is 70 to 8, 189, if you calculate the 10-year risk score and it's uh, 7.5 or higher, uh, then someone who is also uh, infected with HIV, they can benefit from stat uh, statins more. So if you, uh, you know, had a patient who, um, you know, you weren't sure if you should start a statin, but they had HIV, so that can push you toward actually uh, prescribing a statin because they're more likely to, uh, to benefit from it. And of course, these are the statins that are, are recommended, uh, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, so the following year in 2019, the American Heart Association actually released guidelines for cardiovascular disease in people living with HIV. So this is HIV specifically. And they had, they had two types of recommendation. One was lifestyle optimization and one was uh, pharmaco prevention of cardiovascular disease in HIV. So at the top of the lifestyle uh, optimization is smoking cessation, followed by limiting alcohol consumption, uh, increasing um, you know physical activity on a regular basis. And of course, uh, they refer to the 2018 guideline for dietary guidelines, which emphasize vegetable, fruits, legume, uh, healthy protein sources, whole grains, and non-tropical vegetable oils. And they wanted to patients to limit intake of sweets, uh, sugar sweetened and artificially sweetened beverages, uh, as well as red meats. When it comes to pharmaco prevention, um, you know, in general, there are four groups of patients who benefit from statin therapy. And this is similar to non HIV infected patients. Uh, but this guideline, uh, this algorithm is specific for HIV patients. So for secondary prevention, it's basically someone who already had an MI uh, stroke or peripheral arterial disease. So someone who already had, a, had an event, you want to prevent another event. So that would be secondary prevention. And these are uh, patients uh, aged 21 or uh, older with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and they will be considered high risk. So they need a uh, high, high risk uh, approach. Uh, the rest of the, uh, uh, the groups who need uh, a statin would be primary prevention. So these are people who have not had an event yet, but we want to prevent them from having an event for the first time. So it would be, uh, you know, so, so, so the second group would be uh, patients with a very high LDL, so LDL 190 or higher, that would be high risk. Uh, the third group would be the di diabetic patients aged 40 to 75. And then the last group would be people without diabetes, without high LDL, and without clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And in these patients, we calculate atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And they did have three different calculators that you can use. So the most famous one uh, that's commonly used nowadays is the 10-year atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, risk score. And they did say that you can, you know, if it's 7.5% risk or higher, there will be high risk. If it's less, it will be low risk. Now, they do say that these calculators did not have uh, HIV patients in them. And in general, HIV patients are uh, 1.5 to twofold. Uh, they have uh, 1.5 to twofold greater risk of having cardiovascular disease. So whatever you calculate, it's more likely higher in uh, people uh, living with uh, HIV. So for example, if you calculate it to be, uh, you know, 6.5, in an HIV patient, it will likely be more than 7.5, so you can consider them uh, high risk. And um, in high risk patients, basically, you go to this green area, uh, you know, of course, you start with uh, lifestyle, lifestyle uh, modification, so such as uh, smoking cessation, and then you want to use a uh, lipid lowering uh, drug therapy uh, statins uh, primarily 
whereas uh, for patients who have low risk, um, you know, statin therapy may not be indicated. And then when it comes uh, to smoking, they looked at uh, smoking cessation in people who are infected with HIV and compared that to people uh, who had smoking cessation uh, but they did not have HIV. So here on the y-axis we're looking at the incidence of a myocardial infarction and on the x-axis we're looking at the in time in years. So you can see that the lowest uh, risk of MIs in patients who do not have HIV and uh, who never smoked and when you compare that to HIV positive patients who never smoked you can see this is uh, pretty uh, pretty similar so this uh, you know uh, slightly higher in HIV patient, uh, patients who never smoked but still higher in HIV positive patients now when you compare to uh, people who were previously smokers and uh, did not have uh, HIV so you know that's more you know even a history of smoking increased the risk of MI more than uh, HIV did but when you compare uh, former smokers who uh, actually have uh, HIV positive you can see this is significantly higher so a combination of HIV and smoking is very detrimental as far as incidence of MI. And you can see the maximum amount, uh, the maximum risk of MI is in patients who are HIV positive, who are current smokers. So, you know, uh, smoking cessation, you can see that it will reduce the rate of MI uh, significantly. To make things worse, about half of people living with HIV in the US are current cigarette smokers. And cigarette smoking is not only a risk factor for MI, but also risk factor for stroke, uh, for lung disease such as lung cancer, emphysema, and infections such as bacterial pneumonia, tuberculosis, and pneumocystis uh, gerovecchiae uh, pneumonia. Now, one of the problems with smoking cessation is that for majority of patients, it's difficult to achieve uh, smoking cessation. In fact, the rate happens to be in the long term about 12 to 15 percent, at least in, in the studies. So if you encounter patients who are unable to quit despite uh, you know, intensive uh, intervention, including pharmacological intervention, an alternative goal for smokers who cannot quit is cutting down. And basically what that means is that uh, you know, reducing the number of cigarettes per day is actually has been shown to have survival advantage compared to heavier smoking. And studies have shown that most smokers living with HIV can successfully cut down their tobacco use uh, within 24 weeks. So, you know, when you provide education uh, to patients, you know, you can talk about weight loss, you can talk about statin therapy, you can talk about diet and exercise. But the number one th recommendation to discuss with patients should be smoking cessation or at least cutting down on cigarettes per day. We looked at CDC recommendations for PrEP and PEP. We evaluated and managed drug-drug interactions. We looked at patients who experienced intolerable adverse effects and how to manage them. And we educated the patients on importance of uh, lifestyle modifications. Now, when indicated, let's recommend immunization to patients living with HIV. Generally speaking, the immune response in people living with HIV is uh, significantly lower. Even uh, when the patients are receiving ART, the CD4 uh, T lymphocyte uh, remains significantly lower compared to people who do not have HIV. Even the B cell activation will be impacted by HIV, and this is most likely due to the persistent inflammation. Even in patients who have undetectable viral load, this inflammation uh, persists. And uh, in general, uh, recommendations for vaccinations are, uh, are similar in HIV patients, uh, you know, with the exceptions of uh, a few contraindications in, uh, in HIV patients, uh, especially with CD4 count uh, less than 200, because they will be severely uh, immunocompromised, uh, especially when it comes to live uh, vaccines. General, in general, the data for vaccine uh, effectiveness in HIV is very low. 
uh, which has led to under vaccination in people living with HIV. So we need to do a better job of uh, vaccinating uh, HIV patients. All right, let's take a look at immunization recommendations for commonly encountered uh, vaccines. So in one column, we are looking at healthy people. Uh, in other words, people who do not have HIV. And then on the, in the middle, we have people living with HIV. But in general, they are divided into two groups. One that are really immunocompromised. So that's defined as either CD4 count less than 200 or CD4 count less than 15%. And of course, uh, less immunocompromised would be CD4 count of at least 200 or at least 15%. So first we have the inactivated inf influenza vaccine, which is recommended annually for everyone, including people with HIV. So, uh, you know, inactivated uh, influenza vaccine is recommended for people living with HIV, regardless of CD4 count. The live attenuated vaccine, of course, is not recommended for everyone who is healthy. It is only for age 2 to 50, and it's, uh, even then it's uh, alternative because of lower efficacy. But when it comes to HIV, because this is a live vaccine, it's actually contraindicated in HIV regardless of CD4 count. And this is the only one that's contraindicated in CD4 uh, 200 or higher as well. Next, we have pneumococcal vaccine. So most recently, we have PCV15 and 20 on the market. So either of them are recommended for people living with HIV. However, if somebody gets the PCV15, it's also recommended for them to get the PPSV23 uh, eight weeks later. If they do get the PCV20, uh, there's no need for PPSV23. And that is including once they turn 65. So, you know, uh, once somebody gets PCV15 or 20, they're good for life. They don't need to get anything else once they turn 65. Uh, the same is true if they get PCV15 and they get PPSV23 before age 65, then they, they do not need to get it again once they turn 65. Now with hepatitis A and B, HIV is actually an indication to get uh, these vaccines. In addition to HIV, in general men having sex with men and people who inject drugs as well as those who have cirrhosis and who are homeless uh, so if any of these apply to the patient, uh, it's uh, recommended to get the hepatitis A, regardless of CD4 count. And of course, hepatitis B vaccination is extremely important uh, in these patients because co-infection with HIV and hepatitis B virus actually increases the risk of mortality compared to having either infection as a mono-infection. So, um, you know, uh, patients with HIV, Hep C, people who inject drug uh, cirrhosis and um, men having sex with men, uh, any of these are indications for getting the Hep B vaccine. For meningitis, we have the meningococcal vaccines. Uh, we have two different formulations, one that has serotypes A, C, W, Y, and then we have a separate one that has serotype B, and there is one under development which will combine all five serotypes in the same vaccine. For people living with HIV specifically, serotypes A, C, W, Y are more likely to cause meningitis. So it is recommended for uh, these patients to complete a two-dose series two months apart. And then uh, because th these people will be living with HIV for life, they do need to get a booster every five years. Whereas men, in, uh, men B is not really recommended specifically for HIV. However, if the patients have other indications such as asplenia or complement deficiency, then they qualify to also get uh, men B. For HPV or human papilloma virus, uh, just like the germ population, it is recommended up to age 26. And then uh, between age 27 and 45, it is a shared decision making. For varicella, it's important to note that it is a live vaccine, so it is contraindicated if the CD4 is less than 200. So if the patient has severe immunodeficiency, it is contraindicated to give varicella vaccine. For people with CD4 greater than 200, it's a shared decision making. So, you know, it's something that uh, the clinicians should discuss with the patients to basically discuss, uh, you know, risk versus benefit to see if the patient is willing to take this. And lastly, we have uh, 
Zoster vaccine recombinant, which is an inactivated adjuvanted vaccine, and it is recommended in uh, uh, routinely after age 50, so age 50 years and older, regardless of CD4 count. Now here's um, back to this slide for pneumococcal vaccine. So this is uh, HIV infection is one of the indications uh, under immunocompromised persons. As I mentioned, regardless of uh, you know age, once somebody's age 19 or uh, older, assuming they have not received PCV any any PCV vaccines as part of childhood uh, immunization, uh, they do need to get either PCV 20 or 15. If they get 20, that's that's it. If they do get PCV 15, they need to get eight weeks later. They can get PPSV 23. Now, if they happen to have already received PPSV23, uh, they need to wait at least one year since PPSV23 and get either PCV15 or PCV20, okay? But ideally, they should get the PCV first and then PPSV23. That concludes this presentation.